right. Welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Give us a like. Ring the bell. Today on the podcast, we have the uh, infamous, the very, very talkative Peter Love. Talkative. How are you doing, bro? I'm famous for talking a lot. You know that. Yeah, I know. We're going to, this is definitely going to be a two hour podcast. You and I have been uh, going back and forth just. Just chatting it up, man. I, I had to get you on the podcast because we have some crazy conversations, man. And I am looking forward to today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that you, we even got through that first gig, man. It's like, you know, you started bringing up some of these little, you know, points and PowerPoints, things that I'm like, you know, very passionate about. I was like, wow, yeah, this is kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah, let me jump right into it, man. We were just talking about uh, you were on uh, several soap operas, right? And yeah, that's a, that's where I got my start. Moved out to L.A. in, in uh, 1984, and then um, two years later, well, actually, uh, uh, the first year I auditioned for Ryan's Hope, and then Christian Slater got that role because they said that I was just a little too old for it. And then uh, but uh, following year, they offered me a role uh, working with Yasmin Bleeth, um, from 86 to 88, um, and Grant Show, who's now actually on, on uh, Dynasty. He was my roommate back then. Uh, and then moved to L.A., uh, did a short stint on Bold and the Beautiful, and then, um, and then Santa Barbara, which is what uh, sent me down this crazy road uh, going into audio uh, engineering, which we'll get into as, as far as how that happened. But, yeah, I, uh, I started off doing the, uh, the soaps um, for, uh, for like five years of my time, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, and then yeah, I know. Um, after you did the soap opera, you ended up being an engineer in the studios and everything, doing some crazy, uh, yeah, uh, awesome records. And yeah, I was working with um, on Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, one of the girls that I worked with was Tawny Katane, who just passed away. Unfortunately, we had just actually uh, literally had just gotten back in touch uh, with each other, um, and I met her husband at the time was David Coverdale. So they would literally drive to the studio in those Jags, you know, from the Here I Go Again record that she was, uh, the, the video where she's on the front of the car doing that sexy dance that she did. Um, and uh, so he would come to the studio and I was like talking with him. I was like, yeah, you know, I grew up uh, listening to like so many records. And one of the guys, so the guy that produced the you know, Slide In In record with you with Mike Klink is uh, Keith Olsen, man. I, so I was like, I quit my I quit this job if I could ever just go work for him or meet him or Steven Spielberg. Those were the two guys that I grew up idolizing. And uh, and he says, well, darling, uh, in his low voice, he says, I'm working with Keith as we speak. You should pop by the studio and I'll introduce you to him. And I never went, but I, uh, I did eventually end up meeting him through his studio manager, Michael Davenport. And uh, so I just started hanging out at the studio and... And he had just uh, had a bad thing happen with one of his recording engineers and said, yeah, I want to hang out. And so I did. And then uh, when my uh, contract came up with NBC, I, uh, I, I turned out a six month extension to go just hang out with Keith at Sound City. Uh, and that Sound City, which Dave Grohl did, the, uh, eventually ended up doing the documentary for. Right. That's where it was. He had his. They built him his own studio called Goodnight L.A., and it was part of the Sound City complex. But um, and then I uh, yeah. So and when he found out that I had uh, you know had left the show, um, it was one of the first times he said to me, "What have you done?" <laughs> 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 he couldn't believe that I had done that. So um, so I was actually with him until. I wish I could have worked on some of those records. He was working on uh, the Lou Graham Shadow Kings project at the time. So I, was, I wasn't working on any of that stuff, but I was in the studio. Emerson Lincoln Palmer, he did the, uh, the Return of the Manicore record, and then he did a solo record with Bruce Dickinson at the time. Um, I wish I could have gotten credit on those, but uh, it wasn't until 1994 that uh, I started actually officially doing projects with him there. So yeah. It was past his prime, but I mean, I got a really good... Uh, um, good education working with him he was he's he was he's freaking genius so anybody that a lot of people don't know his name but i have equated him to being the steven spielberg of the music industry i mean if you, all you gotta do is just look at keith olsen o-l-s-e-n and and uh and if you've watched the sound city document documentary documentary you'll see a lot of the stuff that he had started i mean he put fleetwood mac together he was doing the bucking and nick's record at the That's time wild and stevie and Lindsay were working at it or living at his house and she was cleaning his house at the time and and uh um what's his face it just quit fleetwood mac at the time bob welch okay and uh he 
that's when the whole Lindsay thing came and Keith said, well, you're not going to get Lindsay without Stevie. And, uh, and that's how that happened. So, Oh man. Yeah. It says on here on, I just, you know, easy to do look up his Wikipedia and it's like Rick Springfield, Fleetwood Mac, Ozzy Osbourne, the yeah. Grateful Dead, White Snake, Pat Benatar, yeah. Hart, Santana, Saga, Foreigner, Scorpions, Magnum Journey, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Joe Walsh, 38 Special, and Eric Bourdon and the Animals, among others, it says. There's a bunch more going on there, but that guy is... Foreigner. Full For, Foreigner was the one that I remember seeing. Yeah. Uh, the Double Vision uh, uh, record. That was one when I first recognized his, his, his name. So anytime I'd, I'd buy a record, his name was on there. But what the hell is this Keith Olsen guy, man? So um, I was very lucky to, to, to have that education. He just passed away last year, too. So, yeah, March 9th, yeah. 2020, right? Yeah. Right when it all went down, he got out. Yeah. Got out with a getting was good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Man, so. he'd put in 39 golds and 24 platinums and 14 multi-platinums. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quincy Jones would pop by the studio. Mutt Lang would pop by the studio. I mean, everybody would pop by the studio just because they'd want to come talk to him. He was known as like the the mad genius or the man with the golden ears. I mean, it's, typical story with him was like uh, Rick Springfield. Um, Keith listened to all of his songs. And when he heard Jesse's Girl, he said, this is your first hit. This is because this, he was still in General Hospital at the time, working on General Hospital, um, managed by Tom Skeeter and Joe Godfrey at the time. And, and, uh, uh, and and Rick thought he was crazy. He's like, I got way better songs than that. And he goes, Keith, he's like, no, trust me, it's going to be your biggest hit. And uh, and to this day, Rick will go, yeah, I just think, freaking prick. <laughs> and he was and he was right. Same thing with Pat Benatar. He made Pat Benatar. I think it was was it John Kalodner? I think was the was the uh, A and R rep on that. I think it was John Kalodner. But anything Keith wanted, he got. And so when he said that he wanted to do hit me with your best shot, to this day, Patty Pat uh, hates him. Never, ever, yeah, would admit that that's what made her a huge hit, you know, a huge star was Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Oh, yeah. he, he said, we're going to do this song. She's like, no, we're not. He's like, yes, we are. We're going to do this song or no deal. Did she, So uh, who wrote that song then? She didn't write that I, song? No, it was, uh, I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, I guess you can take it. I can look it, it up real quick, yeah. yeah. But that's funny. She might yeah. have gotten credit on it or, because Neil being the control freak that he is, uh, 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 w always won. I mean, right before Keith died, he had uh, sued to uh, to get uh, production to be a producer on that record. Hit me with best shot when he had not one producing lick on it. It was all Keith. Oh yeah, it says uh, written by Eddie Schwartz. Yeah, it uh, wasn't yeah. written by it wasn't written by. That was one of the songs Keith would always bring in Billy Steinberg um, and Tom Kelly. Um, who wrote, uh, Billy Stone wrote, uh, they wrote like, like a virgin, um, okay. tons of true colors. I mean, he, I mean, he would go to the Diane Warrens and, and, and try to find that hit if they didn't have it and say, we need to, you know, we need to put this on the record. And they go, why? Because this is going to allow us to do a second record <laughs> because this is going to be a hit. And, um, yeah. So anyway, he was a genius. Yeah. It's wild, man. And, uh, a lot of times that's the case, you know, you can, you see it a lot today where people put a uh, a cover song on their first album and that song's the one song that people recognize and like actually can start to relate to and yep. it blows them up yep. and it's just it's uh it's definitely been a constant in the music industry as of late to where you just do a cover song and yep. then then people will start listening to your music or completely uh ditch what you're doing the typical story um I, uh, I knew that, and I actually asked him in person. Uh, I mixed uh, Sugar Ray for a show here at uh, above the uh, was that the was that the Bellagio above that um, whatever the Chateau the that, that the Chateau nightclub. We were up at the uh, up on the roof. Okay. And I asked him. I said, "Is this true? It's true that you know the they made him do that song uh, someday." Someday when my life has passed me by, you listen yeah. to the whole record. It's like freaking death metal rock. I remember that record, yeah. and and uh, it, it, it I, I believe it's the most returned record of all time. Oh, people, really? People bought it and then returned it because they bought it because of the someday song, right? People that like that song. And then they got to it, and it was the only song on the record that was like that. But that's why the song sold so many. Um, so many, you know, copies yeah. for that song. And the rest of the record was like, you know, 
It was hardcore. Yeah. I I bought that record. I remember that, and I was like, "These guys can get down." I was not expecting this at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but sometimes it's what's necessary because in order, a lot of the times the artist doesn't understand. You know, Keith Keith's saying on that was it's uh, it takes eight years for an overnight success. <laughs> that was one of the, that was one of the things I remembered from him is that that's you know you work really really hard and people think well this guy came from it's like overnight no it took a yeah. long, long time to develop and it's finding that right song and and uh, and finding that right uh, you know that right melt of people and it's an art that you don't get today basic tracking uh, uh, you know occasionally I'll get asked if I want to go in and produce or engineer and and. It's usually the same now. No, because uh, I got way burnt out. That's another uh, orgy and uh, Lenny Kravitz a conversation we'll get into maybe as far why I got out of the studio business. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's basic tracking is a lost art. Getting into the studio. It is. With the with the right drummer and the, and the bass player and is catching that lightning in the bottle. And sometimes it's the mistakes. It's that little out of time kind of out of syncopation kind of thing that makes a song special, right? Um, nowadays, with Pro Tools uh, and DJs and, and cutting things up and trying to make things perfect, it's a lost art, man. It's, you know, the George Martins and the Rick Rubens and the Don Was, uh, all those people. I was very fortunate to actually be in the vicinity. I never worked with Rick or, or Don, but I was around when, I was there when they recorded the, uh, uh, jo um, Johnny Cash's last uh, song, Hurt. That was that was in. Uh, oh, that was amazing. At Sound City, yeah. Um, Cheryl Crow was there at the time, and Tom Petty came in. I mean, it's, um, uh, that was a that was an issue. I, I didn't work on it, but I was there when they did it. Yeah, you know, um, and uh, that whole thing is just. You don't find people doing that anymore, man. The yeah. U2, you know, you two would get in the studio and just jam, and and he'd have that fifty eight. That's his favorite microphone. Most of those vocals, a lot of people don't know this, cabled, of a, a regular fifty eight, not even beta, not even a Beta fifty eight A. He's just sitting there in front in front of two speakers, or, or with the band. And if they were going to be doing overdubs, they'd have two speakers in front of him, uh, sending him a mono signal. Throw one speaker out of phase so that by the time it if properly if you've got the, the microphone right in dead center it ain't picking up any music because oh. one side's out of phase that was one clever side. that was a trick that a lot of people didn't know yeah and that's bono oh. yeah singing with uh, and they tried putting a 414 up in front of him but it just wasn't the same he just needed to have that microphone in his hand and, you know and singing and doing his whole thing so that a lot of the actual final product vocals are him just holding a yeah. 58 in front of a pair of monitors yeah. google it yeah that's or, amazing or, or wedges on the bottom that that's a trick a lot of people don't don't know is that a lot of people can't sing with cans on. It's weird sometimes. Yeah. Well, well what it is, it's, it's ear pressure. Again, it's a Keith Olsen thing. It's you know, it's, it's it's math the way he would like write it down and show what your eardrums are doing when you put certain types of pressure into a headphones. And he had this really cool way of. You ever heard about of, of tuning a singer in the studio? If it's just, if a singer singing sharp or singing flat, do you know how to tune? A singer in the studio. Uh, I, I I have a, you know different techniques that I use, but uh, you now I would like to hear what you have. To say. First, the first thing you would do is you just up means down, down means up. If a guy's singing sharp, you give him a little bit more uh, volume in his in his in his cans until he's singing in tune. Because if if you're if you're pushing too hard, you're you're you're, you're singing above it because you're singing because you uh, you're singing sharp. And if you're hearing too much. Um, and you're singing flat, you bring the volume down and it brings the, 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 the pitch up. Now, that doesn't work with everybody. Sometimes just bringing one can off so that you can hear your tone. You're going, But that doesn't work all the time either. Yeah. So it, it, when that didn't work, we just put two wedges down here uh, and uh, or up here, depending on how they were holding the, the, the microphone. So it, you put uh, and then you mix a mono mix. So it's 100 percent mono nothing stereo just one mix and then send it to to both um speakers but you 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 take because back then you'd have uh uh amps it wasn't powered it was they were all they, they were um, passive yeah. monitors so you just take the the the, the plug and you reverse the plug and now you've got a reverse phase on one side so what happens when you do a reverse phase if you take a mono signal and then split it in the two channels on a mixer put them both in center and then play them both you, you've got signal, but then if you go to the top of one of those and go 180 degrees phase, what happens? It disappears. Yeah. You actually hear nothing. Same thing with two wedges. If you're sending a mono feed 
100% out of phase and, it, and and your singer's okay with it. it. You know what happens is you kind of, head kind of turns a little bit when it's a little bit out of phase, you know? Yeah. But if that doesn't bother the singer, properly placed, you just move it until and you don't hear what's coming out and it's just minimal. It's actually less volume than using loud cans. Oh, now I'm going to mess around with that. I've never heard that before. That's yeah, I'm actually surprised. Yeah, I like I said, he was, he, was a mad, he was a mad genius, Keith. Keith had just so many. He he did the very first six, I can't remember, was it Millennium? Uh, with Joey Steck. It was bad. I mean, this is talking back in the 60s. Keith was in a band called uh, uh, Music Music Machine or The Talk. Um he would play bass, but he, he recorded, he took um, two A-track uh, machines and put an X on them, put them together, and then ran them through through one spindle with a machine in the, in the middle, and then it would return back to the, to the taking reel, and that's how he did the very first 16-track recordings, and if you listen to the song, it's completely, and it starts to drift as it goes down, oh. but that's how he did the very first 16-track um, recording back in the day, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, instead of just uh, doing four or eight tracks and then stopping and dumping them down to two tracks and then right. recording six more tracks over the top of that kind of thing. Yeah, you've probably got a bunch of your listeners right now totally browning out and going, dude, just stop, man. It's just too nerdy. Right? No, no, no. We have techs on here all the time. It's a it's, it's a wide variety of an experience on the yeah. podcast. You know, yeah. Some people tune in just to listen to the musicians' stories, and then there's a lot of people that like all the tech and the... The behind the scenes talk, you yeah. know, that's it's. I find it fascinating, honestly. Work, working for Keith was it was the equivalent of like, you know, imagine getting a chance to work for like, uh, um, you know, some pilot of a seven forty seven, right? And you learn all this stuff, and then you come across a guy that worked for Neil Armstrong, and and <laughs> it's just a whole other level. Keith Keith was insane. He he was just still to this day. I I'm just I. Every time I tried to disprove him for something, yeah, it always he just sit there and laugh, you know, because <laughs> Keith was always a fan of just one microphone per drum. So when I started incorporating a top mic on the on the tom and a bottom mic on the tom, and he's like, oh, "Go ahead, Peter, yeah, go ahead, have your fun." Yeah. You know, the only have one that we fun. would have two mics on was the snare. Obviously, was, um, that was the, the next question. Bottom. Even for the snare, no. But yeah, you, know, you had to. You know, you have to have the bottom snare. I agree. Um, obviously, out of phase and properly properly placed so that you get the. You know, because a lot of engineers don't know that just moving moving that bottom snare at a different angle by just just a quarter of an inch makes a difference. Yeah, dependent upon you know what sound what you're chasing. So anyway, <laughs> that's fantastic, man. Well, you just taught me like three new tricks. No, it's I, no, it's, it's, you know, you can learn a lot of stuff from, uh, anyone. I mean, I'm constantly talking to young kids, you know, that I, that we bring up, uh, we're always hiring, uh, kids that want to learn yeah. and then they come up with an idea and I just go, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why. I, mean, I remember um, I did a, a, a fog hat record and I did this whole little thing, which I won't go into, but it was something I got actually written up in, I think it was EQ magazine. Um, and I remember Bob Claremountain looking at me going, that's really, wow, that's really cool. Uh, it was a problem with gating toms. What I needed to do is the advance, this is before Pro Tools, I needed to advance the toms 25 milliseconds so that when we play it back, we'd run it into the key of the drummers and it would open up the gate before the tom actually hit. Yeah. And so that way, it was, it, was, it, was a whole, it was a whole big thing. I could talk for 30 minutes just on that process of what, we, what I ended up having to do. Three days of slave, I shouldn't say slave, because uh, the master and slave reel quickly turned into uh, A reel and B reel after I worked with Lenny Kravitz, and, and he's 100% correct. So um, taking the A reel and then cloning it over to the B reel and then, and then doing all this stuff, crazy stuff to try to get an, uh, automating the gates through the board uh, with flying faders, it was crazy. It was on the Road Cases record, and uh, I was really happy the way it, we had to because the tom, there's, they used two microphones on four toms, so I ended up having to find out where they were, split it, and so tom one would be on this channel, and then whenever he'd hit the tom two, I would clone that over to a second channel, and then so that we'd have four channels of toms yeah, so from two microphones. Individually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it was a whole thing that we did, but <laughs> and Keith was like, okay, call me when it's done, because he just did, had no, he had no interest in doing any of that. Yeah, that's a lot of just tedious work right there. Especially when we're dealing with the, with the Sony 3324s. When the, they weren't even the 3348s. We were running 48 channels, but he, he opted to have a, it was the uh, the Sony 3324A dash format. We'd have two of them together so that we could, um, at the end of the day, clone over the, the A reel. 
and then have a copy in case something would ever happen. Smart. You know, yeah, with that. This, this is all pre. This is when Pro Tools was called something. No, it was Pro Tools, but you could only do two channels and also in black and white. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, what was it called? I actually had the discs of it. It was. Uh, it was called something Pro. It was uh, yeah. Sound Tools. Sound, yeah, something like that. The Sound like Tools. That. Yeah, it was yeah. back when, it was before when Logic was called E Magic. Yeah, I yeah. Should, I don't know. I got rid of them. It was been a pile of uh, there. Uh, when I moved recently, I had this pile of trash yeah. that I was hanging on to. Yeah. It was like you know little stuff like that where it's like, well, I'm never gonna have a computer with a floppy drive ever again, and yeah. I don't need this stack of like seven discs yeah. to reinstall uh, sound tools or sound designer. Was it sound designer? Sound designer design. Yeah, something I don't like know, that. something like that. Yeah, but I was just I got rid of it. I should have kept like one of them just to have around yeah. for nostalgia. We, <laughs> We uh we never we never had that and then Sound City actually ended up putting in a small room for Pro Tools um, at when they went to eight channels, and then they had a specific guy back. Um, 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 matter of fact, uh, when Keith was doing the Emerson Lincoln Palmer, a guy named Keith Keith something was working with Carl Palmer. I shouldn't say this, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> he, he he did something that I didn't like, and I was like, yeah, forget it. Years later, so um, they they brought in Keith to fix all of Keith's parts because he was horrible. It was one, probably one of the worst drummers I've ever seen play in a studio, just period. So um, if he sees this, sorry, dude. Oh yeah, he won't see this. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he may. Someone's gonna say and go. You know what? You know this Peter Love guy talking about your point. Yeah, is uh, uh, Keith. Keith, 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 Keith. It was it was his drum tech, and so they would take all the parts and put it in the Pro Tools, fix it, and you know, um, same thing I used to have to do with Herman with the Scorpions, but I was having to do it. <laughs> I don't. Are you are you have to a Russian dragon? It was it was it was it's it's called a Russian dragon, but if you spell Russian R U S H I N and then dragon D R A G G I N, it was a it was a tempo tool. You put the click track in the one channel, and then you put the kick or the snare, and it would tell you where it was with the with the with, with the click track. So Herman obviously was you know was not a very good drummer. Oh, he, so you're saying Russian dragon? Exactly. Russian it was dragon. called it was it was by uh, a company called Genius clever. Electronic. Genius Genius spelled with a J. Genius Electronics. Um, and it was a great tool to have. We'd split the click off. We had two of them, so we'd split the click off, and then we'd put the kick into one and the snare into the other one, and then you could set the human control so that it wasn't completely exact. But it would tell you if the kick was ahead of the click or the snare was ahead of the click. And it, it, what, what, what Keith used to use it for was to was because the drummer and the bassist would always be um, arguing about who was rushing or who was dragging. Oh, God. This, of course, would tell you what what, what was what. Um, uh. so I had to use that and then have to, uh, record in, record out between the A reel and the B reel and then offset the machine so that the kick and the snare would be in somewhat of a, of, of a good order. And you'd have to do that. You'd have 12 tracks of drums. You can't just do that on the kick and the snare. You have to cut in on the, on the, on all 12 tracks. Yeah. So you have to set you your, have all that bleed. Yeah. So you'd have to have a certain crossfade that would work and, if 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 he had hit a a, a a ride, you'd have to find that magical spot to go in between, so that the, the ride wouldn't do this, wouldn't do that. You'd yep. have to get in and keep going until you got it, and then boom, put it in the record. So I, you know, I think I was on one song, it was a song called White Dove, uh, seven days trying to figure that out, man. It was <laughs> multiple takes, yeah. Um, that all got fixed when James Kotak joined the band, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So anyway, yeah, I remember I was thinking I was telling you, uh, on that gig we were on, but, uh, for the podcast, it's totally relevant to the story is uh, I had to do a, a, a band and the headphones were all screwed up and the guy couldn't hear his bass playing. And, uh, he just shit the bed really hard. His bass is out of tune. He was playing all over the place. He wasn't in time with the drums because his headphones was all messed up. Live, uh, live uh, uh, yeah, they, or studio? It was a studio record, which just blows my mind. But the engineer screwed it up so bad, and then they called me in to like fix it. And, uh, and of course, my immediate response was, uh, well, I got a bass right here, so I'll just play these parts over again. Oh, and we yeah. won't tell anybody about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and they were just like, no, no way, it's got to be his plane. And I was like, his plane is trash. There's no there's no fix in this, you know. And they were like, no, you can fix it. You got Pro Tools, or like, why don't you just like, you know, cut it all up and do. It? And I I ended up having to uh, 
chop it into sections and then auto tune the whole thing. And so grabbing every note he played and tuning it into position that it needed to be and then chopping his, his timing up and like creating these loop sections of bass playing and then looping them through the, through the whole album. I had to do the whole album like that. It oh took God. me forever. Wow, yeah. Yeah. That's just a nightmare editing. That, that happens more often than not, man. I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell this story is very quick now that Keith's gone. Because um, I, I think I think a lot of people r knew it, but maybe not. And I don't think John Sykes would, 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 would worry too much about anybody saying it. But on um, the Here I Go Again record, um, uh, or no, it wasn't Here I Go. Yeah, it was Here I Go Again. Or it might have been the one that Stevie. No, no, it wasn't that one because that was when they brought in Steve I. Um, uh, a lot of those... Uh, uh, solos and guitar parts um you know john sykes was on the record but a lot of people don't know that dan huff played a lot of those guitar parts from from the band giant i love giant dan huff was awesome man matter of fact speaking of giant mike slamer was in that band and he was producing the oh no no i'm sorry that was a uh, that wasn't fog hat that was uh that was a uh, uh steve from kansas uh it was a that was a solo record that keith had done that's another great story having that send Terry Bozio home to bring in Virgil Donati. <laughs> That's one I won't go into because that was not a good, that was not a good thing. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, that was, that was Dan Huff on a lot of those parts on here. I go again. I don't know if he ever got credit for it, but it was, um, and it wasn't because John was playing bad. It was just a few parts that were, they, they didn't work. And then Keith had Dan listen to what John Sykes had played and then they had to redo it. But John had already taken off and was back in England or back. I don't remember what it was, but, but uh, but that yeah. yeah that happened a lot man. Yeah, you weren't getting them back in the studio to redo their parts. It no, was just like deal there. with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, unless it was David. David was a was a David Coverdale. Coverdale. He he is absolutely from what I understand. I never got to work with him in the studio, but he was uh, not only just a gentleman but a, a, a total perfectionist guy. Oh uh, really? Yeah, and would just you know be back in the back doing his thing and bring him in for his for his his vocals and he just go out there and just scream it out, man. Some amazing. of the best vocals the '80s ever produced, man. The only 10 plus that Keith gave any artist ever uh, twice was the Here I Go Again when he did that. Here I go. Oh, God. That part. Um, and that's about as loud as he was singing, too. Um, it, it, insane how these guys can go a whole, uh, the Lou Grahams and, and, and David Coverdale, you think they're just screaming, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, screaming. Uh, they're not. It's just basically it's a placement. And, yeah. Uh, uh, and they can sing like that all freaking night, man. Um, but it was that one. And then uh, the Still of the Night was another one. It was a, oh, there, yeah. There was a thing that he did in Still of the Night. And Keith would have them sing um, four times. Yeah. All right. And then they come in and then everybody would sit down with this graph and every line was written. And then there was all these little uh, 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 squares and then you'd, you'd grade it. So you got a you got a seven just for stepping out there. OK, so if it was really bad, you got a six, but you got seven just for just for getting behind the, the microphone. And then you listen to it. Go, oh, that was really good. I give that an eight plus. Um, and then you know, I, that was I like that one. It was a nine. And then you'd, at the end, you'd um, you'd ask what everybody did. You know, and you go. What everybody think about that line? And at the end, you at, at in the in the tally, you'd have the tally of what was the best line. And so you had all four um, vocals coming in on the console, and then those four, and they'd all be on on mute. And then you'd unmute the one that you wanted, and then you'd at the same time you'd hit both buttons, and it would mute the one, and then unmute the other one. And then you'd go through, and then you'd record that to a, a fifth track, which was your comp track. And then that's how we comped. Uh, uh, and that's how we used to get all those great vocals. Yeah. There was no starting and stopping. You either did it or you didn't. Um, the, you know, and nowadays you just go line by line. I like that. Okay, line. It's just yeah. no vibe to that. But that's the way he would he would he would do that. And I remember him saying that he gave ten ten and a half to to two parts. One in here I go again, and then one on still of the night. Those are the only ones ever, huh? Yeah, yeah. And nobody else ever got a ten. There was always just nine, nine plus. Like he had it down to a system. Like if you had like a line that was like, let's say it was like 12 words for that one line and he, you'd see like, okay, it was nine, but at the top there was a minus sign and at the bottom there was a plus sign. What that meant was that I like this line, got to take a look at that, but, the, but, but the, at the top of the line, there's something that's a little pitchy. That's what that minus sign was for. Oh. But at the end, really, really good. He'd get that plus down there. So he had it, he had it to a, to, to a science as far as comp and comp and tracks. I still, oh, to this man. day, if I were going to do that, even on pro tools, I would use a, you know, a controller 
and just have them all down there and then just comp them to a, to, a, to another track because by the time you get through it, four minutes later, you're done. Yeah. You, you can get that done in four minutes rather than going in there and going, okay, cut that one, cut this one. It takes you six hours to do one freaking vocal. Screw that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always like this separate function. You just click Apple E, drag that onto a track, just go through and, and grab your waveforms and dump them real quick. But so w when I would record vocals, and this is a trick I learned from my buddy uh, Lavin over at Digital Insight uh, when I was first uh, coming out to Vegas to engineer, was uh, we would play back their original vocal. So when you were recording like four takes of vocal, would you actually play them back their original vocal to sing back to, or would it constantly be empty space? Cause what, what do you mean? Like singers, uh, it's like singing to the radio or singing in the shower where you can, when you have something to sing along to, you kind of feel more confident. And so whenever I would play back their first take, they would sing over their first take as uh, if like they were singing to a song on the radio. No, you would do that if you're doing back. Keith was big, big on, on, on doubling vocals. He yeah. did that for that. But no, no, you just go to the top. I mean, you're talking about the singers that actually wrote the song. There's a band kind of thing. So they know the song. Yeah. It was more for unconfident singers or like people that were having a little bit of struggle. But it, it also was nice to have the right. doubling effect whenever you were done yeah. for the finished product to have multiple takes yeah. where they were singing to themselves. Yeah. Speaking of doubling effect, I'll tell you, uh, if you listen back to like a lot of the Rick Springfield stuff and anything where you hear the vocal and you go, what is that effect? His vocal sounds so wide. That's really neat. Um, Keith had this thing that he would do uh, where the vocal's in the dead center once you got the comp and then he'd run it into, um, it was, matter of fact, I'll tell you what, what it was. It was the, uh, <laughs> it was the SPX 92. Oh, the it was Yamaha, right? Yeah, the SPX ninety two. Yeah, there were two effects that he would use. But anyway, there was a there was a stereo delay on that, so he would set. There was something to do with he, the reason he used the it was nineteen and thirty four, and it was a there was a there was something to do with tape delay back in the day that he said sounded magical when it came to vocals. So what he would do is he'd run the vocal through this delay and in the on, now on the yamaha he would set the dry to zero and then effect 100 and it would be coming up on one of our other uh, on, on, on a bus so he would run the vocal through that so the, the the dry vocals in the center and then 19 millisecond delay on the left and 32 mil, 34 milliseconds on the right so what would happen was that the vocal was doing this uh, the middle and then would shoot over to the left and then shoot over to the right with no with no uh, feedback it was just it was just one uh, a 19 millisecond delay on the left 34 millisecond on the right and it would spread the vocal out really wide i was i i always wondered how he got those vocals so freaking wide like that and um he would overuse it on some stuff and then not, you know, use it on stuff. I actually took that home once. And remember the old, um, uh, uh, the rock man, the Tom Schultz rock man back in the day. I don't know if you ever played guitar through that. Uh -uh. Yeah. Well, I would run that and then I would do the same thing with the, with the, I'd run my guitar through that and it would just spread it out and just sound like a freaking God. It was freaking awesome. And, and then nowadays I look at it, it's just really dated. You know, I like, I like, I like a dry vocal, really, really, really like dry vocal. I like, uh, I like that, um. Michael Jackson, black or white. Check, it, check that out. You'd think that there'd be a lot of delay and reverb on his vocal. Bone dry. Yeah. Bone freaking dry, you know. So, um, but that was an interesting effect when you're talking about doubling. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, I, uh, I've, I've pulled away from it for, for the longest time. I really enjoyed putting a lot of effects on the vocals and learning about effects processors and everything. I think it was more of the, the, pro the, the process of me learning how to use all these things yeah. really well that made me really interested and put them all over everything. And now it's more just a little bit, just wetting it up, make it make it fit in the mix real clean, but like don't oversaturate it. It almost doesn't want to have to be there. Yeah, if you can put enough in there to where it actually, uh, um, you don't know it's there. Yeah. That's, that's the secret. If you know it's there to me, I mean, you, you know, unless you're doing all these old ba type ballads, but back in the, like in the eighties and a big, huge, you know, we actually had a, a real room for our drums. Uh, oh, he, nice. he, he had built with walls in different shapes and, and then we just put some microphones back. There was a real room. Um, you know, so unless you're going for that effect, but man, I, I just, I've become a real big fan. Like if you listen to like the Steely Dan and even some of the Eagle stuff, when you listen to the drum or listen to the uh, old ACDC, there ain't nothing on Angus's guitar, nothing on Bon Scott's vocals. It's all bone dry. And what I like about that as a singer here in Vegas is um, it makes you sing differently. If you don't have a, if you don't have a trail, like for, if there's, if I'm doing a cover song like Rebel Yell, 
I've got my own delay on my on my box, and I'll and I'll kick it on right at the very end of the word so that it only picks up that and it does, uh, uh, you know, for certain things yeah. like that. Sure. But I, I always say, pick one, don't do reverb and delay. Oh, okay. Just do delay. If you really want, you know, because for me, reverb to me, I don't know. It just, it, it makes singers sing lazy in my, in my opinion, you can easily trail off your word to emulate what a reverb would, would be doing, but it's so much more cooler, you know, to be able to just work that the end of that, of that uh, of that word, instead of you know, uh, you, you, uh, you know, and 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 do it yourself. It's, uh, to me, it's just so much. To me, it's just so much more cooler. And um, and when I hear people like David Coverdale or listen to a really cool um, Lou Graham track, um, Keith would always have him do this thing where they'd finish that word and then before they go into that next sentence, he'd make him get up on the microphone and they'd do the one of these things. He'd like, he'd finish that one sentence. Uh, and then before they start that next word, the next sentence, they'd get in on the microphone and do one of these things. And do, and, and, and they would actually do the breath on purpose. And they would like close their teeth, put that tongue up there. Cause if you just do a breath, it's, Right, but if you close your mouth, it's so much cooler. I I, uh, I I love stuff like that. Yeah, you can really hear that on like in the still of the night for yeah. sure because it has all those breaks and then yep. the vocal punches in first. Yeah, yep. Lou Graham when he did Shadow King had a song called Russia, was really cool, and you could just hear him get in on on the microphone and 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 he was so good at it because when you get on the microphone, you can hear all that low end, right? So you can either do a voice, uh, you know. <sighs> And hear all that low end, right? And then in post, have to take get rid of, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a low shelf and ta- or a low cut and take that up to I don't know, one sixty if you want to get rid of all that low end if you want to hear the breath. But he would either get up to that and then and then and simply by just going, there's no low end on that because all the all the all the breath is coming through your teeth and your tongue. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's like doing voiceovers, cartoon voices. You know, oh, right. Which is like ACDC, uh, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Johnson. It's just a cartoon voice. <laughs> it's all it is. He's not screaming. It's just a little cartoon voice. Yeah. You know, so all those little tricks were really cool. And it all came from Keith. It always sounds like he's just screaming his friggin' head off. I went loud in the middle of a railroad track. <laughs> it's not very loud. I can do that yeah. all night. I mean, it's just a cartoon voice. Oh, that's funny, man. We got to tell some of these, uh, some of these ACDC tribute bands about that trick because uh, they scream their asses off into those microphones it, as hard as they can. And at the end of the night, you go back and they're just hurting and they need tea and honey. You, and- if you look at the greatest, some of my, my, my vocal heroes, uh, Freddie Mercury, you know, oh, he sang, how, how, he was a high singer, right? Yeah. He was a freaking baritone. He wasn't a tenor. He was a baritone. Yeah. I mean, he even said that many times. One of my other favorite singers, Chris Cornell. Yeah. He was a baritone. Uh, talk about David Coverdale. You ever heard him talk? Have you ever have you ever seen him on an interview? No. All right, let me let me let me do David Coverdale because I mean he's you know then he rang, oh! he's like up in that stuff back in the day because he also sang for uh, was it um, Purple um, Deep Purple? Yeah, Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and uh, but uh, if you ever hear him, I mean you know the, when I first met or when he would come to the studio, he was like. Uh, or, or if he's introducing himself, he says, hello, I'm David Coverdale. <laughs> That's a David. Bring him up. That's exactly him. He's like, oh. hello, I'm David Coverdale. He's got that really low, low. He's a huge baritone. Yeah. Yeah. It's all placement, man. And, uh, and, and again, uh, uh, Steve Perry, um, uh, Lou Graham, I remember the Led Zeppelin record we were working on. He came in and, uh. And Keith said, hey, set up the, uh, we had two 414s. We had one 414 that he used uh, on uh, all the Rick Springfield stuff and the Pat Benabar stuff and the, and the hard stuff. It was a classic. It was when the, the diaphragm was really thin. So if you went up on it and went pop, pop, and popped it, you had to wait 15 minutes for it to come back. <laughs> so we would put two popper stoppers on it um, and in order to get you like, right up on the microphone. So we had that one up. He comes in. And uh, he's doing his typical, he's eating, I don't know if it was fries or Doritos, because that was a trick I learned also. Stevie, you know, if you watch, watch Stevie Nick on stage, she always got like gummy bears or something in her, in her, in her, in her cheeks. Um, and, or fries, 
or Doritos. I don't know if it's the fat or the salt, but it 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 does something to your tone. It gives you all this 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 really cool, thick but like wispy tone. And so he's chilling on those things, around some water, and and so Keith um, plays uh, "Stairway to Heaven," which is one of the songs, you know, obviously one of the songs on the record. It was a Led Zeppelin tribute that uh, called I think it was called "Stairway to Heaven." It was a uh, Asian released overseas. Had everybody: Lita Ford, Sebastian Bach, Slash, Jeff Pilson. I mean, tons of tons of people. And and then Lou. So Lou comes in, gets behind the microphone, and uh, and. Uh, um, and I'm just setting up the microphone, and he's got this cans on, and he just starts. I thought he was warming up. He says, "There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold." I mean, whispering, like that's you know warming up. And uh, I'm going okay, and I look at Keith, and he looks at me uh, uh, through the glass, and he and he's like this, meaning record. That that meant record, and he's did this. And I'm okay, that's interesting. So I just sit there, and so I can't hear anything but just Lou singing, right? Um, and said so at the end, as we go on the road, he's like singing, and, I, and I, just like that, like he's just kind of warming up his voice, you know? And uh, I'm not thinking anything of it. And at, so at the end of the track, um, you know, I look over to Keith, and Keith makes that, 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 that face that he always made where he smiles and he goes, so we go in, he starts playing back the track, and literally, I mean, it, 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 you could have been punking me that that he had come in an hour earlier and laid down the track, something different. Yeah. But it was what he had sang, and it sounded like he was screaming <laughs> his freaking voice out, man. And not to mention, because being there... When you hear, you know the, that 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 in, that in, that first line, there's a lady who's sure. No big deal, but you go in there, it was all this high, bright stuff on his vocal, and it sounded like you were right in his throat. Really? Yeah, and and uh, and if you listen to the track, that was the take. He didn't even do another take. Keith had him uh, drop in one part because Lou didn't like what had happened on it and one little drop in and that was it that was the take it was freaking it, it was the biggest uh vocal lesson I ever I ever had and that was uh that you don't especially you have to have in ears in in order to do that you can't do that with monitors yeah you know you have to have in ears um and uh, and be in a particular situation where you, you, you can control the sound but what uh, microphone were you using for that 414 414. It, it huh? was one of our 414s. It was one of the original ones. Like I said, if you if you had one popper stopper on it and you popped it, you know, I can't yeah. believe I'm popping. I'm usually pretty good at doing my B, my P's as B's. Well, you're but, explicit, you're explicitly popping. You're doing explicit, it on purpose. Yeah, but um, if you didn't have both popper stoppers on it, uh, the the diaphragm would fold, and it uh, and it and, and you'd have to like let it hang for. I don't know if it was because Wild. of the moisture, but it sounded so good, man. It yeah. was. Uh, yeah, all those uh, big drum sounds that we had, those were the two uh, 414s we'd have on the overheads. And Okay. Yeah, that's the next thing I was going to say is it's funny you're saying it's such a sensitive mic because I've always used those as, uh, as stereo overheads for drums. And yeah, well, which ones are you using, though? you got to get the, the new ones probably. The newer ones, right? yeah. Not the black the and the gold ones. slides? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah those, you're, you're getting the, stereo, the, the, paired, the paired ones, right? Yeah, yeah, the match pair kind of yeah. thing, yeah. They've gotten much better, man. It's just I've always been a 414 fan. I love Neumann 87. I like the Neumanns, the, 80, the, U80, the, the 87. But I like them when you first buy them because this is, the, and again, this is another key thing. It's just tech shit. Is if you don't if you don't keep that in the box, um, the reason Neumanns and in, uh, in general start to sound so warm uh -huh. is because was it the the diaphragm is positively charged, no, negatively charged, and the ions and the dust in the in the in the air are positively charged or negatively charged it's one or the other i can't remember what it was i think i think the diaphragm is negatively charged and the uh dust and stuff that's in the air is positively charged yeah so what happens is if you've if, if, years and years of use it gets onto the diaphragm that's why you th there are people that clean the di that, that that get your neumanns upgraded and they go through and they clean them and um that's that's what happens with neumanns occasion at least really? in the older ones yeah the 40 the, all, all the older ones but but the 87s they uh you know, wow, they're so warm. You know, go buy a brand new Neumann and put it up there and see how bright it is. Sounds great. Um, but years of use. And again, I don't know if they've changed that, but I know back in the day. And that's, again, that's just what Keith used to, 
to uh, uh, explain it. So You know what? Maybe you can answer this question for me because I was asked this recently. My buddy's going into the studio, and they have the U87 available for, at the studio, and uh, and then um, he's asking me if we should be using the 47. It's like a $12,000 Neumann. And um, and I was like, man, I don't have experience with that microphone. And he's like, well, what's the difference? Like, honestly, I, it's the one's worth six thousand dollars more than the other one. Yeah, I don't know. I can I can tell you very 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 simply, uh, with one word, listen. Yeah, I mean, I don't I, I don't you know, it's 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 such an interesting. Uh, concept to actually, you know, not use your brain or your eyes for th- for things when it has to do with sound, and that's just well, which microphone should we use? I don't know. Who's the singer? You know, if you put Cheryl Crow uh, in, in the studio, I, I, I'm going to say between two microphones. If I'm going to have to pick between a 414 and, a, and, and an old Neumann uh, 87, I'm going to say the 87 because her voice cuts through like freaking a knife. You know, or if you were going to use Axl Rhode. Axl Rose, I'd go for the for the eighty seven because you wanna you wanna uh, mellow out his tone a little bit. But if you're gonna have Michael McDonald or Brian Adams in the studio, I'm gonna go for the four fourteen all the time because they've got that nice wispy, airy type sound to their voice, right? Yeah. Um, it just depends on what you're what you're going for. You know, I mean, if you a saxophone, I'd probably put a four fourteen on it because you want to hear all that breath. Uh, but if you're going to be looking at, like, say, a violin, 87, because I want to tone down the highs. So, you know, but then again, you just don't know yeah. until you get out there and and and, and try. But uh, Keith Olson, again, remember the source. I, you know, anybody that's ever worked with him, they're going to tell you that. That was the, the very first lesson I got from him. Remember the source. And that is if you can fix it at the source first, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of problems later in, in, in mix down. So find the right tool for, you know, whatever it is that you're going for. So between those two microphones, I don't know who's the singer. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just a friend of ours, man. Yeah. He's just doing a cool little thing. Uh, depends on the singer. Yeah. I mean, again, I just don't know if you got, you got Barry white. Right. I, I don't know if I'd use any one of those. I'd probably call manly up and see if I can get one of their gold reference microphones. Um, with the, with the onboard pre already built into it, you know, but these days, man, it's all, again, I, I go back to Bono, man. I mean, the right singer, it doesn't matter. Just give him a freaking microphone, man. You know? Um, and these days you can do so much in post, but I've always believed in, again, remember the source, use the right microphone and, and you're good to go. That's always the case, man. Like uh, a lot of people just jump jump forward through the tracking, and they're like, "Well, we'll fix it in pro- in post. We have Pro Tools. It won't be a big deal." And it's like, ah, uh, you don't need to rely on all that stuff. You're gonna make shit sound terrible by the end of the day. Yeah, they, they, this 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 is one of those things, uh, like with a with a kick, uh, a kick microphone. And uh, generally speaking, you know, back in the old days, you put like three microphones on it. But the reason you do three microphones at different lengths is why it's 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 phase. You're, it's a manipulation of phase. You're going to get certain frequencies that are going to happen. And you know, back in the Beatles days, you had to because you had a you know you had, a, you had treble and bass. So <laughs> how are you going to cut some of those mids off of your kick? Well, you move it into a certain. They had that down to a science. They knew exactly what the inches were, how many feet you had, so that if you wanted to have a a dip in 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 uh, you know Keith's one of his favorites uh, was like a, a two twenty dip because if you're going to add low end around eighty hertz eighty to one hundred something's got to give especially if you're using NS ten uh, monitors you you need to make room for that extra uh, low end then he would yeah. he would cut like two twenty you know to make room for that depending on what you're going for but um, with his one microphone rule generally speaking. We try to find a really nice spot really close to the skin because a couple things happen. Um, you're going to get that click right off the skin, and um, meaning you can also now bring your, your, your mic pre down by about probably 40%, maybe even 50% because the microphone's so close to the beater, right? Yeah. Um, so what's that going to do? It's going to bring all the extraneous noise from your cymbals down. And from the toms and from the snare, you're gonna it's gonna it's gonna isolate your kick a little bit more because you've got more signal to noise ratio. And if you don't like that click so much, you know, rather than move the microphone and then bring the 
the mic pre up, which is going to be bringing in more extraneous noise, you just EQ that click out, which is what? High end, right? You're going to be yeah. taking some of the trouble out. So what are you also getting rid of by doing that? Some of the cymbal bleed. Yeah. So you actually end up fixing some of your problems by properly placing your mic. And that's not going to work for everything. You know, some people like putting that mic in the middle so you can get some of the resonance. But we were dealing more of with more rock. Yeah. You know, uh, and by putting it against the head, you're talking about the beater head, not yeah, the outer head. The beater head inside, yeah. I love doing that even in a live situation. Uh, it, was, it was a Percaro trick, um, which Jeff Percaro told him was what my my first official session ever, 1990. Before I was even working, it was a, it, it, it was a, a demo thing. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know who Jeff Percaro is, notably the greatest drummer of all time with Toto. Um, uh, died much too uh, young. The Rosanna Shuffle, that was Jeff Percaro. Um, doom, the God, doom, the doom, God, you know? Um, he was just awesome. But um, trick, one of the tricks was for certain sounds is he's just, uh, you, you uh, loosen both heads and then finger tight, right? Yeah, Especially yeah. in a live situation because it's just goes that ka, 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 and it fixes so many freaking problems in a live situation with, the, the front head, you know, if you if you're bringing the kick up too too hot and you don't want to use gates, you, you you loosen it up and it gets rid of that that happens when you start bringing it into the subs. Yeah, and so that was a really cool trick that I got uh, that I learned from well Keith mostly, but but Picaro was the uh, was the drummer on it at the time. It was like the fall of 1990, like September October something like that. Uh, anyway, yeah, so. Yeah, tuning drums is a, uh, that's a big one, man. Like the, the way people tune drums uh, over the years, they really suck at it. A lot of times I've had to just step in and, and fix it myself. Because, it's a lost art. Yeah, it really is, man. And just learning how to actually get it the right, to get it to resonate in a specific frequency and not sit there and ring. And yep. Yeah. Every and, drum is different, man. It's, you know, I, I'm not very good at it, but I, I know how to beat on the side of it and go, and then you tune it until it's like, oh, there it is. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, you don't get that, uh, that sound, you know, when you're, when you're playing your toms. Yeah, we had a, um, I played in a, like a punk rock, hard rock band, and we had this terrible drum set that I bought for like 160 bucks new, and uh, so it was just dog shit shells, but we put in, uh, emperors on there, uh, and so we actually were able to make this terrible drum set sound reasonably well like it, it really it really cracked for us you put emperors on all all the, all the drums including the snare yeah oh. on everything we got we because we have access to old used emperors being in the production industry oh, and everything very so cool. yeah, yeah so i was just like i had a stack of them in, in my uh, garage for the longest time uh, just for that because we trashed the drum set you know so it was like at the end of the night we trashed the guitars trashed the drum set so yep. we didn't have time to put a, a nice expensive kit up there it yeah. was like as cheap as we could go yeah. but we we were just blown away by just taking our time before the show and really tuning those things right even this cheap piece of crap uh drum set with good heads on it man i mean it sounded fantastic good drummer will make a bad kit sound really good and emperors emperors were always used for life in in the studio is always the ambassadors because you, oh, yeah. you do one or two songs and you and then your drum tech would come in and then and then uh the coded ambassadors yeah and then switch them out because they just had a, a nice little ring to them the emperors they use on the snare a lot because they'd last a lot longer. Yeah, obviously, you know? that's what I liked about them. Yeah, but on the toms, it was always the ambassadors, the coded ambassadors. Those always sounded really good. Yeah, it's convenient in the studio to be able to switch out the heads every few songs. Too. You know what? Something else that we used to do uh, occasionally, if we had a, if we had a drum kit that just wasn't doing well, we just take the front head off at the kick and then take the bottom heads off of all the toms. Yeah, and um, sounded great. Yeah, reduce some of that ring and all that. Yeah, I mean, you just tune the the top head and and. Uh, yeah so yeah anyway yeah man well you had uh you had one of ray's kurzweil's first keyboards in one of your studios yeah, man. right you know I, the thing is i didn't really get the chance to uh, uh appreciate this this guy for you know all the other stuff that he wasn't uh known for because this guy i think he's does he does he have a record for the amount of patents that uh this, other than I mean, tesla might have come close but i think he ray kurzweil well, he has to, especially with the Singularity University that he has, where yeah. they just have all these patents out into the future, where yeah. when nanotechnology becomes a certain size, yeah. then this patent is yeah. uh, already yeah. Re registered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he, he, he brought in, I don't know how he knew Keith. I don't remember if it was a plane thing, because Keith had two planes back then. He was in Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, he came in, and he was, 
you know, because he, I mean, he was known for his keyboards, you know, the, the Kurzweil's, but he had, it was the very first, um, uh, it was an 88 key, weighted key. It felt like a real piano too. Um, but it was, there was no sounds in it. It was just a controller. Uh, keyboard controller and he brought in the very first one it was a it was a it was a production model before they had had uh released it and said uh, you should try this and we had uh was it the mp was it the, no not the mpc it was the akai the uh was it the 1000 that was a sampler right the 1000 i think it was the akai so, 1000 yeah. yeah it was like a like a beige colored thing we had one of those and uh Oh wait, no, no, no! We didn't. He le- he brought that in. Uh, uh, Ray brought it in with the keyboard, and it had uh, all these samples on there. And we were all excited because the piano was like I think it was like there was uh, there was there was four different samples deep on each. I think it was like two octaves, and then each it was each two octaves was the same samples. It was four samples deep, and we were all excited because if you hit it soft, it made one sound. If you hit it really hard, it made the other one. But, you know, in, in today's standards, it's just crappy. But, yeah. Um, and I think the 1,000 was, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I th- uh, oh, wait, no, that was the 900. I'm sorry, it wasn't the one. I think it was the 900 because it was still, I, th- I think it was still 44, 116 bit. It was before it was before the samples went to 24 bit. So, this is, yeah, it was a while back. But um, it was really cool. And so the uh, the keyboard stayed at the studio like forever. And then I remember getting a call wondering, you know, if you could get that back because it was the very first one. It was 001. Oh, man. Studio, and we couldn't find it. And um, I think I actually I think he had actually come in and picked it up and then it just misplaced it. We never heard back from him. But I think I think I think that was the thing. I think he actually had come back in and picked it up. But um, yeah. So um, and yeah. I've become a big fan of his ever since. He is a fascinating gentleman. I actually am a very big fan of his, too. I read all his books, and uh, I am uh, somewhat of a transhumanist myself. I think it's kind of, uh, you know, inevitable in a way that, I mean, maybe it doesn't happen by 2045, but the whole concept of, like, humans merging with technology, I mean, unless we destroy ourselves, it's going to happen. Have. We already have. Yeah. We already it, have. Being a, when you take a look at what Elon Musk has been doing with that thing, the, the brain. The oh, brain. the Neuralink, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're already we're already looking at Ready Player One. I mean, you can always write it. You can already comp- control your computer, mouse, and keyboard, and all that by just thinking it. Yeah, they've got that cap. Have you seen the uh, the video of uh, of Elon Musk's uh, chimpanzees controlling video yeah. games with the Neuralink? Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about the thing that they put into the brain, right? And it can be yeah. taken out because when yeah. he put that in there for, I think it was it was also supposed supposedly it was going to 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 help figure out if you were going to get cancer, what would have to be done. Um, I can't remember what that was, but yeah, uh, great, uh, great. I mean, yeah, it's, it's fascinating technology because like, um, one of the beautiful things that it's going to be able to do right away is help with Parkinson's trimmers. Right. That's what it was. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, right now they have a singular implant that'll go into your brain and you actually have to have a chest pack that, uh, for the battery that runs all the way up your shoulder into the, uh, into the single probe that goes in your brain and stimulates the area that needs right. to be stimulated to, to stop these trimmers from happening. But with Elon Musk's, his is initially going to have a thousand and twenty four. Uh, probes that go into the brain, and so there's all these functions that they, they can't even come up with yet. They're just right. trying to, you know, just making the interface, right. and then it's going to be sort of like your cell phone, where all these aftermarket things can come up uh, one at a time as the as the market develops, and because uh, it does, it links with your cell phone via Bluetooth. I right. mean, it's just ready to go right in right. the market, right. and you'll be able to, uh, you know, get all this information from uh, from your brain activity as well as you know help stimulate certain areas that require stimulation. Right. But yeah, that's that's. Uh, it's wild stuff, man. Ray was the very first, I think. I mean, when he was talking about the singularity, but I, I think did he first say it was twenty thirty four and then change it to twenty forty five? Was it? I, 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 from what I recall, I thought his original book that he released in the eighties said twenty fifty, and then he pulled it back to twenty forty five due to the accelerated uh, speed of technology. Right. Yeah, because well, yeah, well, he, yeah, he had. It showed this it made a lot of sense. I mean, it, it it's and it's it's this curve that can never it it, it it can never really go this way. It can only go straight up, which is the singularity when it when 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 AI uh, becomes self aware. 
Uh, and there have been a lot of uh, talks about what happened because of what Ray started um, on what's going to happen at that particular point. You, and, you, and you just don't know. Um, you know, um, I mean, can you imagine if, if, uh, if a computer becomes self-aware, it's going to be smart enough to know, well, I got to be careful about this because they can right now they can unplug me. <laughs> yeah. So um, imagine with all these uh, uh, robots and, and these um, realistic robots that everybody's coming up with um, that once this AI can put themselves into this robot and just act like it's being controlled by a human. Um, but yet on the side, <laughs> it's, it's figuring out ways to create another being that it can be in that cannot be manipulated. And then, you know, how many years would it take to, 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 to build a whole army of it or even by itself? Can you imagine? I mean, it's just with this COVID thing. If the right, if, if, if AI wanted to destroy humanity, it would just come up with a freaking virus that doesn't kill any of the plants or any of the animals. It just kills people people in general and yeah. well, uh, well let me see this particular blood type we'll make sure that it doesn't kill them because we might need a few people around to do some of the heavy lifting chores yeah you know it's not that difficult man yeah well i mean uh honestly like elon musk says it's uh the real threat is uh if we're building a road and there's an anthill in the way we don't even consider the Hell ants yeah. we just build the road over the top of the anthill and i think the computers would look at us about the same way where they're not i don't even think we'd be that much of a threat to an artificial general intelligence that, that actually is at that level because the second we can make something that's that significantly smarter than a human being it can self-replicate another model of itself that's smarter than it and then that one can replicate a model in, that's so smarter in than it. In seconds. And yeah, in seconds. It'll just start doing this protocol to rapidly accelerate its own intelligence. In seconds. And uh, yeah, and then it's just out of our control. But at the same time, uh, you know, that that system will be able to to bring about things like cold fusion and near light travel and all these different things that we, you know, artificial gravity systems and solving all the problems of like global warming and, and food distribution on the planet. And, right. Uh, so there's, the, you know, there's definitely the dy dystopian view of the everything, but there's a very utopian view of it all. And a lot of it uh, leads to um, what they say uh, about all the catastrophe that technology is creating and the accelerated pace of everything that's going on. Climate control, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Climate change, climate change yeah. and uh, and like war and all these things. It's like, unless we keep pressing in and we can't really not keep pressing in there's no there's no putting the the brakes on this thing in, in any way shape or form it's going to continue to accelerate at this pace but it's like as we keep pressing into it eventually it will unravel into this uh into this you know saving grace of our time man you know we're probably going to push this thing right to the precipice it's been written about many times we as humans i mean we think about it we're so we consider ourselves so so freaking important that um when you look at the math um, I mean, literally, and I th there's been a lot of talks about this too, and I'll say it, uh, there's, uh, there's only one way right now to cure all these problems, and that is population control. I'm yeah. sorry. The, you've got one planet, and there's only a certain amount of people. Can you imagine living on a, on, a, on, a, on a street, and then all of a sudden you're inundated with, you know, you've got 100 people, and then over the course of one week, you have 700 people, and you can only afford maybe 230 people? Yeah. Um, we, we, when did life happen? I mean, as far as uh, humans, uh, 175, that, when was the first? I think they found, uh, you know, uh, human uh, remains up to around 200,000 years. Ago. Okay, so I was, I was pretty close. I was saying 175, 180,000. So um, it took uh, uh, 200,000 years, approximately 180,000. Uh, 200, let's say 200,000 years to put 1 billion people on this planet, and then 212 years to add another 6 billion. Yeah. If you don't think that something bad is going to happen from that, you know, I mean, all the, uh, what was that study when they threw uh, two monkeys into a room, three monkeys in a room, and then they, they threw a whole bunch of them in there, and it came to a point to where they started uh, uh, fighting yeah, uh, I, I, it was back in forties and fifties when they did that, and uh, and they do the same thing with rats as well. They start killing each other and eating each other. Yeah, when everything get, needs its own space. Yeah, so when you got that many people, um, you know, it's 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 bound to happen. Man, we got seven billion people, and they're and they're thinking how, how many people in the next twenty years? 
the the higher estimates are around 14 billion right. but then the the more uh, recent estimates are around 9.5 billion total because of a uh, phenomenon that's happening again with the technology mass uh, extinction advancing kind of, yeah. no no not mass extinction but um the reason the population is is so accelerated is because a certain level of technology has gotten to a certain point, but then there's still these antiquated systems. So, like uh, in countries where the uh, the death rate of children or infants and the infant mortality rate is a lot higher, these uh, the, the average is you know they're putting out like five children per family household, uh, as opposed to in America where we're doing two two point five children per household, and uh, those start going down rapidly as the technology uh, emerges into those markets, and so what slowly starts to um what slowly starts to happen in these places is that the the birth rate goes down because the infant mortality rate goes down and then the uh, quality of life goes up and so these places that seem to be accelerating out of control will uh actually stabilize and so that's where the estimate of around 9.5 billion top is going to happen because uh, and it's uh, it's it's written about very well in uh, Paul Diamandis's book Abundance, uh, who's Ray Kurzweil's partner in the University of the Singularity. Right. And uh, yeah, he goes into it uh, pretty deeply in uh, in some of the things like with uh, these water purification systems that are going all over Africa, and like uh, Coca Cola is uh, sponsoring these systems, so they're taking charge of the maintenance of them. But they can drop them in these uh, isolated villages, and you can take water that's just mud and Ebola right, and right, right. AIDS yeah. and pour it into these things, and it will put out pure water that you can inject into your bloodstream, just sterile, pure water. There are these amazing systems, and you can drop them anywhere. They're battery powered, and you can uh, you can charge those things with solar power, and uh, and so companies like Coca Cola have jumped on board these uh, these operations to get these systems out to different populations that are, you know, they they, they need clean water. It's one of the major causes of death in those places. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so yeah, and then access to the internet and and uh, a decent education online, where some certain places don't have uh, educate public educational systems, and proper food production. All these things are going to uh, add up to where people don't need to pump out five, six, 10, 12 children, where you see these massive uh, increases in population everywhere, just so they can get, you know, three of them survive, and two of them are going to go get jobs to support the third one to go to college, so somebody from the family can get, you know what I mean? But it's this, it's this insane desperation where these people are just like, well, three, three or four of my kids are going to definitely die by, by the time they're one years old, right. and so they just keep having tons of children. What uh, what is I've, I'm trying to find it I can't find this uh, I remember seeing a uh, a TED talk on um, it, it, it's it's because uh, when we're looking at the amount of people that was supposedly going to be born uh, by the year 2050 I believe it was it was um, they said it's it's going to start going down and, and they said you can also start to see it already start to happen that uh, women men become infertile somehow or another because of of uh, uh, when there's too many people yeah. on the planet and this is another one of those things with animals is that when there's too many people you'll find that they can't they can't have babies Really? Yeah, and I was trying that's to. Crazy. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find that. It's not eugenics. That's something else. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of that, but that's definitely. I, I've I've heard a lot more um, as You're, of lately, like in vitro fer fertilization and different kinds of. Uh, of processes to actually help people who can't have children have children. That's like much more regular. Yeah, it's something to do with uh, the the earth takes care of itself somehow or another. It's, yeah. it's you know we're we're due for mass extinction anyway. Oh yeah, there's there's definitely a mass extinction that's gonna that that's gonna happen, and not in our lifetime, hopefully. Well, I mean, we are the extinction event. If you could look, be. if well, you look well, at the yeah. numbers, yeah. Uh, the the planet has just been suffering mm -hmm. serious levels of extinction yep. all over the place. I mean, we're losing, and it was happening anyways. You know, every year, uh, you know, several hundred species would go extinct, but now it's turning into thousands, if not tens of thousands, of species going extinct, and right. it's all based on us destroying the environment you right. know especially especially things like in the oceans uh where we're just trawling the bottoms of the oceans there's a mucus thing that that just happened right that there's is a, there yeah was it the black sea they're saying that the black sea is probably going to be dead because yeah. there's a uh there's a there's, there's there's a mucus being let out 
uh, uh, and it's killing all the fish. It's, um, it's, it's some kind of a mucus, mucus thing. Uh, 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 let me see. Black Sea uh, mucus. Um, I was watching that on... Uh, uh, black oh sea. yeah, Turkish sea mucus extends from the Sea of Marmara. Marmara. It, it's 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 a uh, 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 sea snot. That's what it's called. Yeah, sea snot uh, outbreak in Turkey. Um, what, what's what's causing it? And uh, yeah, mucilage. That's what it was. And they're basically saying that the Black Sea could actually just be dead. Um, you know, a lot of them are going to start being dead. I mean, the, the population can't really keep up with what we're doing. As no. far as the overfishing that we do, it's really crazy. Once, uh, once the sea is dead, man, once, you know, uh, algae and plankton and all that stuff just starts to die, man, we're, it's forget about yeah. it. That's what creates all the oxygen. Everyone's worried about the rainforest, yeah. but it's like phytoplankton is what, what creates the majority of the oxygen yep. on the planet. Right. And, you know, speaking of Elon Musk, I, I mean, I wonder if anybody's actually said to him, <laughs> Uh, you know, before we just be sending people off to Mars and try to terraform Mars, why don't we see if we can terraform the Earth? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, the uh, physicist, what's his face? Tyson. Uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. I love him, man. I love yeah, watching. Yeah, me too. I'll, I'll go to sleep watching YouTube all the time. And he 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 talks about, as far as like with aliens, uh, what you had said about the ant, the, the ant thing yeah. is that we, we consider ourselves the most, you know, dominant species and with the smartest thing there is but he's like you know imagine when someone you know because uh, he's got his um doubts about all these ufos that are yeah hitting and it's like you know do you really think if those if they, they're sending probes to to, to to watch us if look if, if they were doing that and they were that advanced we wouldn't see it yeah there's no freaking way they're not that stupid you know, um, and we're very, we're very low on the, uh, as far as technology goes, man, you know, I mean, we can't even control our own weather. We're still relying on fossil fuels for power. Yep. Like it's, it's, we're not a very advanced civilization. So as far as, uh, I think Neil deGrasse even, Neil deGrasse Tyson even said this was, uh, he goes at the, at the most, we're some backwater swamp that they can come yeah. check out real quick. Look at the, look at how yeah. far back. Yeah these people yeah. are so someone's yeah so some aliens either got a, a, a weird sense of humor yeah. and it's like God, let's just some some of these things down let's just, let's see what they do i i personally think that it's you know it could very well be if you're gonna i'm not into conspiracies but uh this is a fun one is that um w what if all these things that we're seeing are actually uh uh, United States owned and they're doing it on purpose to let the rest of the world know there's something else going on. Well, see, here's the, now, you, you know, we're, we are getting into conspiracy theories, but I actually saw a government document with the, uh, that, that was released from so long ago where it talked about the threats of communism, uh, becoming the first initial, like, we're going to continue this war forever, right? right. That we, we have to have a perpetual war to keep the global military industrialized. Which is between the government, not the people. You put the people yeah. together, we're all fine. Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about selling weapons right. and everybody getting a big piece of the pie selling weapons right. and keeping that party going because that's like one of the most profitable things you can do on the planet of course. Next, to, next to, you know, pumping oil. Yeah. And so... I saw this document uh, from the Freedom of Information Act, and it was about the 9-11 thing, right? So they said they're going to do the communism thing, and then once the communism thing starts wearing off, we're going to do the terrorism thing, because you can't really define terrorism, and so we'll be able to keep that going for a really long time, and uh, and then, you know, we'll hit our own, we'll hit some, some location in the United States, and, yeah. and that'll trigger it, because... They've always done false flags, man. They got us in the World War One with false flags, World War II with false flags, Vietnam with false flags, and so... Yeah, of course they got us in the the uh, Afghan wars with a false flag, and then uh, after that starts wearing off, it literally says in this document, then we'll do extraterrestrial. We'll start putting out like, and we'll do a hit. Some at some point they're going to attack us with some kind of weapon we've never seen before on our own soil or somewhere on the planet, and they're going to say it's aliens, oh. and then they're going to fund this ridiculous war against a, a invisible force, just like even more invisible than terrorism, and say we're being attacked by aliens, and it's going to be lockdowns and crazy shit it's just con continuously taking away our freedom and controlling us as well as they can with these crazy ideas and i I'm, i just i was reading one of these documents on the freedom of information act and right. i probably got it from like watching alex jones or something like that like yeah. i don't know i can't remember where it came from but i remember I, I vividly like like aliens is the next step to this game they're playing on us right it was it was communism terrorism aliens 
and uh, and here we are. The terrorism thing's kind of faded. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. And so what happens? Oh, now the news is reporting aliens, and I'm like, oh shit. They're going to hit us with some kind of crazy laser satellite, and they're going to say aliens are hitting us. And they have these, you know, like if you watch Bob Lazar on Joe Rogan or like that documentary on Netflix. Yeah, he's where he's, full of shit, though. Yeah, I'm just saying he was talking about the government they, has these facilities. They're trying to create these vessels with anti-gravity. But how do, you, how do you believe a guy like that that's already been, they've already proven they didn't go to any of those schools. Yeah. Um, he's full of shit. They've already debunked him so many, even including Joe Rogan. Yeah. They, they've already found. And so w- once that happens, man, I mean, you tell me, two plus two actually equals five and I go out and find out that you're full of shit. Yeah. I can't believe anything that comes out of that guy's mouth. I mean, he's, you know, entertaining, but I'm not, I can't, I can't go down that road. You know, it's like Alex Jones. He's already been, I mean, the guy's crazy. Oh yeah. He's absolutely crazy. <laughs> he's freaking nuts, man. Yeah. You know, so. but he does, he has landed a few, uh, right in the hole, man, Alex Jones, you know, he says a bunch of crazy shit and then like, there's this collection of it that he was like dead on with. It's that blows my mind yeah. how crazy it is. But no, I'm just saying it's all hypothetical, but yeah. like, you know, the, the whole concept being that obviously we're advancing our weapons technologies further and further and we don't just have drones right like yeah. that's not this that's not the most advanced weapon that we have but it's mm-hmm. the most advanced weapon that we use right but there's all kinds of stuff that we're not allowed to see yeah. that's definitely going on behind the scenes and one of those things could be one of these like pill you know the pill thing that's going around the news right now where they're like oh it's definitely a ufo and it's like well it could just be the next level of technology we've been working on for the last 50 years right that they didn't actually get from alien technology yeah I mean, it's not actually aliens they've already i mean there's so much tech I mean, tesla i mean even back then i mean tesla came out with so many different ways of having free energy but that doesn't do anybody any good because you don't make any money on it right yeah but um uh i i i personally believe that there's you know there, not for the reasons you're bringing up, but I think that there, um, there's, there's, there's definitely a, an explanation as, uh, as uh, Neil Tyson, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil, yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah, um, has said. There's, he goes, this, you know, anything that deals with aliens or weird stuff. There's, if you, if there's no, he, he, this is what he said. He said, you know, with so many people with phones, you yeah. got to think that somebody at some has like. We'll take a photo of it then. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, why is it, you know, you, you do selfies right now and it's so crystal clear, but yet what, why is that uh, object that's, that's only you know, a few hundred feet away? Why is it so, why is it so blurry? Yeah. You know, that's it. You know, there's no real clear evidence. Yeah. So, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things, man. It's like, what are they actually, what are they actually getting at? Because for me, I mean, the alien seems kind of ridiculous like the vast amount of space that the universe covers and what you're going to send flesh bodies all that distance right i mean at the most maybe probes like we do but they, they would have to have some seriously advanced uh transportation where they're moving faster than Warp light speed. they would they, yeah they, they would they would you're not actually traveling faster than the speed of light you're mm-hmm. actually just folding a piece of paper and then going from this part to this part and then you know warping space yeah so i i in order to be able to do that You'd have, I mean, so the uh, the universe is how 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 old? Uh, Thirteen to fourteen billion years. Right, and when you technically speak about how long it takes for life to form from a single cell single cell organism, you're talking billions of years until you get you know creatures that are actually walking on on on, on two limbs to where we become uh, human. All right, if we're all in the same universe, if we're all in that same, uh, if you're going to go but with the Big Bang Theory, th- then it would be safe to say that any other uh, species or any other civilization has progressed as fast as we have. Yeah. So uh, if that's the case, unless they've got super, super human uh, people on, a, on, on the other side of the, of the you know, universe from where we are, the same galaxy or a different galaxy, um, then nobody has that po- the possibility of warping space yet, and who knows? I mean, it's you know, so I, I just think that there's you know the way he speaks about it, it's like yeah, it'd be stupid to think that there's not other uh, life out there. If there's water, um, then you have to think that that's they they progressed or they, or, or they you know, as fast as we did, and they're going to be similar organisms. The only difference would be these have different a, a different language. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting uh, stuff to think about. And and again, like it could be the difference of, say, 10,000 years wouldn't be a big deal. But as far as technological advancements, 10,000 years would be huge and maybe we could warp. Uh, but we would be, wouldn't we be seeing something? I mean, right? No. Like what's the big secret yep. that they, they aren't going to communicate with us? They're going to travel all this way and not... Actually, would we do that? That's why, again, again, yeah, would we would we actually travel all that way and just hide in the freaking shadows and send little freaking balloons down to the surface? Right? No, we'd be so freaking excited to have fun. First of all, you'd be traveling how many, how long? Yeah, if you're coming from the nearest, uh, I think they said the nearest possible planet, uh, is like a hundred some, um million light years away or something like that it's i don't know how many light years it's it's a long way do you know it's actually uh wouldn't it be alpha centauri and i think it's uh something like uh three light years let me see let me see here i think it takes something like three years to get there three uh, three uh, three uh, three light years uh, traveling the speed of light yeah that, that's the that's the closest inhabitable planet that they've possibly found 4.37 Four point three seven light. Four point three seven light years. So what they're doing right now is they're creating these things called uh, laser sails, and they uh, they exponentially gain speed, and so they're putting a shit ton of cameras on them, and they're sending out like I, I don't remember the number, but they're sending out a ton of these laser sails towards Alpha Centauri soon with cameras, and they're just going to haul ass past it, and they're just going to snap, 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 and then shoot the images back to us, and it's going to take four and a half years to get there. And then another what? four and a half years. Wait, wait, you're saying it's four and a half light years? Yeah. So the, but that means they have to be going to speed of light, which we don't know anything can go speed it, of light. It gets pretty close. The laser sail thing, it's 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 ridiculous. So it mean probably like five or six years to get there, and then the, four and a half years to send it back through RF transmission. Okay, well, wait a minute. It, it, so it's like a 10-year journey to get a picture of Alpha Centauri. Right, but, but here's, here's, a qu- here's, here's a question. See, this is what yeah. I want to ask. Because the thing is, the l- law of relativity tells, t- 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 tells you that if a human can can go the speed of if, if light, like, like say, for example, if that was the case, get pretty close to the speed of light, yeah. and you get there in like, say, five years. Let's say five years. Five years. I mean, yeah, okay. let's say five years. And then you turn around and come back. No coming back. They're just going to haul ass past it Snap pictures, but if you and could, shoot. but if you could, but yeah. if you could, if you could turn around and come back, oh, okay, yeah. Um, if you're going the speed of light for ten years, w- what what year would we be on here when it got back? Because the thing is, uh, going the speed of light, they've already proved that the faster you go, they've already done that with the twin, yeah, you know, and clocks. That the faster you go, the clocks get off yeah. slightly. So going the speed of light, I don't know if they figured out if you're going for, t- if you go five years and back and you're going 10 years of speed of light, right? You have travel, let's say 10, 10 light years. What, what year would we be, would, you'd come back 10 years older. You would come back. Like if you were to go, if you were not, if, yeah. if you and I were to go, we'd come back 10 years older, but what year would we be coming back in, on earth? Right. it could be like 80, hundred years later. Yeah. Yeah. No, so the, uh, but yeah, this is just a this is just a photo fo- uh, a camera they're sending out that uh, that'll actually be able to make it there in a reasonable amount of time because it gets near the speed of light. It's not quite light speed, but, but yeah, it's late. They're called laser sails. Let me see if I can look up an well, article it's, on yeah, it. But, yeah, but here, wait, 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 let me ask you a question. If it's going almost the speed of light and you're trying to go into Alpha Centauri, which there's there's one planet, yeah, you're, how are you going to take a freaking? If you're going the speed of light, man, how are you going to take a photo? Of that planet, if you're traveling at the speed of light, because the speed of light, you're gonna, you're just gonna zoom <laughs> right by it. That's a great point, right? right? I mean, I, I'd imagine they're gonna be snapping them all the way up and and, and past. Yeah, but still, you, and you, you're, rapid fire cameras. Ap- you, you understand cameras? Your aperture yeah. and your shutter speed would have to be so freaking fast. Man, yeah, it would. In order, because otherwise, it's just gonna be blurry. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I, I didn't invent the technology. I just well, read about it in a book. Did you see that uh, that uh, talk about when they uh, they shot? the speed of light going through a bottle uh, at like a trillion times. Uh, 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 they, they, they slowed it down like a trillion times to one. Um, Nuh-uh. Yeah, that is pretty damn cool. You can see the light going through the bottle. They shot a pulse of light through it. And um, so they actually they, they actually videotaped the, uh, the speed of light. Um, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's pretty impressive. I didn't know they had that information because yeah. all Are you the- looking it up? I'm looking up solar sails right now. It's actually oh. solar sails, not laser sails. 
Yeah, because because uh, well, uh, solar sails won't. I don't think are those are not going to go to speed of light. Yeah. You'd actually have to have something shooting. That's why when you said laser, that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense because yeah, no, I think it is laser sails. It's sending an impulse into the. It, it's got to be sending something into the into the sails to continue it going. Yeah, we blast. So when they they take off, you shoot these lasers from the planet. Right. At the at the sails and it, it exponentially increases in speed up yeah. till it, where it starts nearing the speed of light. It was a hypothetical technology, uh, but then they actually built it. It was one of those things I think Stephen Hawking was working on or something like that. But uh, I was reading about it I think in a book by Paul Diamandis or Ray Kurzweil. One of those two from the Singularity University was talking about. It, it might have actually been Michio Kaku. And another it, thing about it. So it was that because that, that, there was another thing they were talking about, which was a a a. a uh, a device. It was an engine, um, and I think it, they, what they're talking about is that it would it it bounces and it bounces inside and it just continues to push forward. Um, had some, it wasn't nuclear, but it was something else. I can't remember what it was, but that was that was something else they were talking about that could could possibly get to the speed of light. But now they're questioning. And the thing is, man, this thing about can you go faster than the speed of light? I mean, yeah. do we really know? Um, you know, I mean, you can guess. But Einstein was wrong about a few things and not right about everything. Yeah. You know, um, so who knows? Yeah, and we really, uh, as far as I knew, we didn't actually know the exact speed of light. There's always an estimate of it. It was mm-hmm. just one of those things that was hard to measure mm-hmm. because, I mean, all your measuring equipment's always going to be slightly off from the actual. Yeah. And then, and then all these equations that we have are always just kind of guesstimates based on the estimate of the speed of light kind of thing. Yeah, well, uh, dark matter just came, I mean, the uh, the whole thing in space just came out, what, a few years ago. They didn't know what the hell that was. I know, isn't that a that's, trip? That's, they still don't know what it is. That's kind of scary. Yeah, you I know? mean, the universe is an interesting thing, man. Like, uh, I, I don't think we'll ever really know all of it, right? There'll always be this next step and this next step and this next step as we, as we progress in science, but, like, knowing what the... Knowing what we're doing here in this crazy world that we're in, this yeah, and we're not even here, and we're not. Yeah. The thing is, we're not even here forever. I mean, at some point, they're gonna have to figure out a way to get people off this planet. You know, somewhere. I mean, I, I've said many times that the, uh, I think the entire planet, China, Russia, uh, us, whoever, should be working on on putting together a, uh, a city in the sky they got to put together something to where people actually live out there because what the hell happens on a mass extinction like what happens if yellowstone blows up tomorrow yeah that, that's basically the entire planet's done yeah and we're due for that i mean it's was 660 some thousand years ago was the last one and if you look at when every time that it's you know um science has been dead on right about that um when it blows yeah, you and know. I mean, there was that uh, that volcanic explo- explosion like sixty thousand years ago in Indonesia or something like that. Yeah, and that that brought the yeah. population down to like seven thousand people. Mm. Uh, it's just it's it it will happen. It has happened. It'll happen again. The, the the whole thing with asteroids they they don't. I mean, there have been close calls with asteroids. We didn't even know were happening. They, yeah, with all the with all the technology we have, they've missed a few. That's freaking scary too. Well, I mean, it's just random rocks, and then they'll collide in space, and then they'll go a different direction, you know? Uh, it's just, what are you supposed to do about that, man? You know, really? And yep. that's, that's, how are you supposed to track all the rocks in space? Yes. And when are the two galaxies, when are our two galaxies supposed to, uh, to collide together? That's a, I think that's around three billion years from now. Oh, that's three billion? Like that. we'll yeah. About yeah. And what, uh, Andromeda? I mean, I'll look it up and give you the answer. Yeah. Uh, that's, but, an, that's an interesting thing, too. Because the thing is, I mean, look, at some point, at some point, there will be uh, immortality. It's just—it's just not going to be the way we—the the way we think of it. Uh, there will be some sort of an immortality, uh, whether it's—you uh, know—they're talking yeah. about downloading your memories and putting it into another brain. That I don't understand how that's going to work. I would understand if they could take your brain and transplant your actual brain into another body. Yeah. That you would wake up and go, "Oh, I look different." But as far as taking your your thoughts. And then putting it into another, you're still going to wake up and, you know, it's just, or your thoughts are going to be, it would be, uh, it would be like, you know, uh, it's not going to be you. It'll be another being that has your memories. Yeah. But it's not you. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the thing that I can't wrap my head around in. And that is, you know, I call, if you're going to believe in a soul. Yeah. I believe what my soul is, is just basically electricity. Now, electricity, when I die, 
it has to go somewhere. It doesn't just die. It doesn't. It's, it, it, it goes somewhere. It's grounded. It might go into the ground. It might yeah. go up into the air. But that electricity ends up somewhere. Yeah. Ultimately, your awareness has to rejoin with the rest of the universe. Right. Man. So when you when you if, 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 if call it uh, uh, reincarnation. Yeah, you don't remember anything because it's freaking energy. It, 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 it's all is just energy. You you become another person, but it's just electricity, and you don't believe. You know, reincarnation. I just think that your electricity leaves your body, and and yeah. it, and then it just enters into another body. Otherwise, if it was reincarnation, how the frick? Where are all these these six billion new uh, souls coming from? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, come on. If reincarnation were a thing, you'd say, okay, how many people do we have? One billion. Okay, one billion. He dies. Another person opens up. Okay, that energy goes into that person. Now you know you're you, yeah. you, you're you might remember who you were. You might not remember it. But so I just think that well, it's energy. Yeah. Well, with reincarnations, so there's a lot of actually great uh, case studies of people who have past memories of reincarnation, and yeah. they can they can um, recall all this interesting up until about like four years old. They recall all this information about their past lives. And there's real people that lived, say, 40, 50 years before them or something like that. And uh, so the reincarnation thing is real interesting. And when you dig into it, you're like, this is a little too on point to yeah. just be a coincidence. Yeah. But um, the other thing being like, uh, if, you, if you're talking about like your awareness of your soul or anything, you go into like Buddhism or Hinduism and they talk about the karma of everything and they talk about um, samsara, the, the mm -hmm. cycle of birth and death. So yep. it's after a while, even the 1 billion souls that we were talking about, those are some of those are just going to end up in nirvana and not be reborn again because they finally reached the, uh, the state of enlightenment that you're actually trying to reach in this, on this lifetime. And then there's all these new souls that are popping up because the Godhead is just infinite awareness separating and all these things. So it's kind of interesting stuff uh, on that aspect. I just but wonder then, where they get that information because I believe I, yeah. uh, the, the, what, uh, you had me up until that. But when you talk talking about you, you, you don't come back anymore because you're now in this other spot. Yeah. Where do you get that info? I get the reincarnation right. thing because there's actual proof. Yeah. Kids talking about something that happened, it doesn't happen unless he was coached or she was coached. But if that's true, that's fact. But now you're going to tell me there's a heaven. How do you know that? Yeah. So, well, it's not so much heaven yeah. as the, like rejoining the, the sea of awareness or right. something like that. You know what I mean? Kind of concept right. of like, you get, like, what's the purpose of reincarnation? This is all, you know, then it's yeah. just hypothetical, hypothetical philosophical, philosophical yeah. discussion yeah. that, the, you know, the Hindus and the, the Buddhists and Taoists and stuff like that yeah. get into, which are the main reincarnation religions. Right. right. So, yeah. And then it's just like, well, we're here to kind of learn how to be at peace with ourselves and let go of all the suffering and everything like that. And then we don't need to be reincarnated anymore. Which is an interesting concept and actually leads to a lot of cool things. But what I was going to talk to you about is the immortality thing that you were yeah. talking about. Ray Kurzweil offers a really interesting pers uh, perspective on the immortality argument on how do you get away from that's just a copy of me. It's not me when you transport uh, all your memories and everything into it. And he goes, well, the way I'm going to do it is um, I'm going to slowly replace individual pieces of my brain with these uh, processors, these this like uh, digital brain material that he's you know working on, and so it's just like when people have a damaged section of their brain and this part isn't connecting with this part, they actually put a, uh, um, a chip in their head, and it passes the electrical signals across the synapses, okay. and it acts like that missing piece of the brain. Okay, and so when you replace that section, all of a sudden their brain works perfectly again, or well well again and they're still them right they're still the person so ray comes with the concept of we'll just do it piece by piece so there won't be the this big drop of my entire consciousness into another form but instead i'll bring the other form within myself and i'll replace one section at a time and wrap that surgery up so you replace just like you know just one one piece of your brain recover you're still you Replace this other piece of your brain, recover, you're still you. That's and so interesting. you get that. to the point where all pieces of your brain have been replaced, and, and now you have a synthetic brain. It's a hard drive. Yeah, and it's a hard drive kind of thing. But now, but again, so how do you how do you go about this is whole soul thing? Because I'm I'm yeah. not you know the only reason I'm even really just out of respect for mom and dad, but you know they're they're passed on now. So mom, dad, sorry, but I I got to take the scientific approach to this and just go, you know, how is that going to work? Because you know, you're talking about, you know, hardware and when 
do you at some point you just go blank and and, and you forget because here's the here's here's the scary part about that if you're gonna start doing hard drive type stuff what happens on an EMP pulse is <laughs> yeah you're you're gonna you're gonna fry. But I mean, your brain's all electrical signals too, and I mean, I imagine. I guess you could, could have do... backups on that. I guess. I yeah. Mean, you, know, you could just back it up, but they they talk about every time you go to sleep, you would just create a backup. Yeah, yeah. but the, it, this is just a, it's an interesting concept because again, I can't wrap my I can't. It's this whole thing, this whole future thing, and then you know we we can't go back in time. Now they're going well, maybe you can, but you know it. I, I don't. I, I, I'm. I'm having a hard time. The only. The only logical. Again, this is. We're. We're, we're both sound engineers, so yeah. our our minds work usually different than most people. It's that astronaut yeah. thing, um, and that is the only way I can possibly think that you would still be you. Yeah. Is if you could take your head or take the brain out and and you have like for example a clone of yourself at 20 18 years old right yeah and you take your brain out and then put it in and somehow or another all of your spinal cord type stuff it all just attaches perfectly and then when you wake up you look at yourself because it's your brain i mean that's it's your computer right yeah you're waking up in a new in a new body but if you if you're if you're replacing this tissue with stuff uh how do you how do you remain your I, I, i'm i'm conf, i, I yeah. understand it I, I and i could imagine only taking out maybe you know we only use how much percentage of our brain seven percent well I, I mean at any given time but i mean you do use the whole brain right but but, but there's a potential of you sound like uh who said that uh the, the, my my point is that if you look at what it at, we actually use of our brain, I mean the capabilities, yeah. and and it's only you've got all this extra room that you can you can replace. What about the stuff that you're using all the time? When that gets replaced, I, I I'm just kind of I'm trying to think of how in the world, unless there are different parts of your brain that let's say this part of your brain is storing these memories and that's you, but just in case it's a backup, so it's also storing this over here. So you've got two or three different versions of you in your brain. You can take this one out, but you still have it working over here, yeah. and now it's relying on both of those. So, I, I mean, he's a smart man. I'm well, sure. there's some interesting things that happen with the brain. Like there's a condition where people end up having these um, serious seizures, and they have to separate the uh, or even remove an entire half of the brain and so you can separate the connection from the, the left lobe and the right, uh, right lobe of the brain or the right. sorry the left and the right hemisphere of the brain uh, and you start functioning almost as two individuals you don't it doesn't come out so much as your two individuals but you do um, your left and your right hand and your left and your right eye and everything like that they kind of function on their own terms mm -hmm. and uh, and if in the cases where they remove an entire half of the brain Motor function and everything still remains the same because the brain tissue is so malleable and like elastic, it, it creates the different required uh, lobes and, and portions of the brain that were functioning on the, uh, the defective half. And so it'll make up for all that. But uh, essentially, like, you know, we're not like a static being anyways, right? We're this constantly shifting pattern where like billions of cells are dying off every day. Oh, that's true. And um, and so like, and even with your brain, they, they used to say your brain tissue doesn't regenerate or whatever, but then that's been debunked as yeah. of late. Yeah. And, um, and so technically like every 10 years or so, your body is this whole new collection of cells. It's the pattern that remains the same the energy as it were or uh that that keeps it in focus as this pattern of pete or this pattern of jason but it's the the, the actual physical individual cells are irrelevant it's always the pattern that's significant and so when you can replace all the cells with different material as long as that material is arranged in the same pattern right. is kind of the concept between it but yeah it's uh it, it, ultimately, it's only a temporary fix to immortality as it is because, like you said, we were talking about the Andromeda collision with the Milky Way, and that'll happen in 4.5 billion years. So you got 4.5 billion years, right? Because once that collision happens, who knows? But also our sun will go out. And then if we have to escape this galaxy, we have to come up with some kind of form of warp speed or or. Um, or some wormholes, right, right, or some sort of a, of, a, of a device that allows you to uh, to live. But the problem with that is that there's space debris all over the place, and all it takes is one little thing to go through your ship, and you're 
freaking yeah. screwed. It's less than the size of a pebble. Yeah. And it'll, and it'll destroy the whole ship. The entire ship, yeah. yeah. You know, you brought something up uh, that, that, you know, about the reincarnation and 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 if if that if that is true let's let's take, let's take an example that that's true yeah so it goes back to what i was saying about it being electricity or you brought up even a better a better term energy right yeah so if that's true then what i was saying about well how the heck do you are you actually you because if if as a kid you have all these memories of who you were and then all of a sudden you know how when you when you have amnesia and then all of a sudden it comes back and now you remember who you were again. Yeah. If that, if it's as, if it's as easy as that, okay, then, uh, then it would be, um, it's not a matter of downloading all of your information from your brain. It's a matter of trying to, I guess people call it the chi, right? Or whatever your, your soul or your energy is, it's trying to tap into that electricity to where, uh, you could, uh, kill yourself yeah. right they, they put you into a sleep and then you die and then that and there was a way to harness the energy that's leaving your body that carries all the information that's in your brain and putting that and then instead of that going up into the air and then 50 years from now entering into a small little child who now has all those memories yeah if you could take that energy and then transfer it immediately into an avatar, you're good. Yeah, as long as you have the the you know the the memory sections of of what you it's used the, to be. Right, it's the energy because yeah. well, I've been thinking about this whole thing. You made me think about this. Now I'm going to go home and have bad dreams tonight, or, make, <laughs> or write a movie about it. No, you know it's. It, it, uh, the, the I believe again when you die they've they've proven that when you die you lose a certain amount of what was that one uh, what, a certain amount of weight that, that disappears from your body have they actually have they actually confirmed that I thought that was a thing that they were trying to but they never really got yeah well they were talking they're trying to think they say well maybe it's because your your breath goes and there's that and yeah but there's definitely something they can you know it's just I don't know it's, it's, I, but if that's what it is then it's not it's not the information that's important yeah it's it's the uh, um, it's it's whatever that energy is that's within the you. The awareness. Yeah, it's the awareness and the energy that carries all the information. And I don't know how you would compare that to like a, a computer or, you know, cloning a computer over into another computer. Um, but it would, uh, well, maybe it is. I don't know. It's just if it, it, it wouldn't be taking just the information. It would have to be taking whatever that thing that you call energy. If there was a way for them to tap into that and go, oh, we understand what this energy is now. Yeah, it's electricity, and it has it's got this, and it's you know a whole chalkboard full of uh, algebra and math <laughs> and physics, and you go, that's what we have to do. Yeah. Let's just do that, and then let's just make sure that we've got a body over here that's dead. You know, a young, you know, a, a, a young body that's eighteen years old that we've been growing for the last eighteen years, and uh, uh, it's not alive. And the only way we can make it alive is to take this energy and put the energy into that body. And you wake up, and it's you. Yeah, I mean that would definitely be uh, a, a an interesting way to go about it, man. That seems like a super hard thing to do, but I mean, if if like you said, it's a, a just a mathematical equation of acquiring what the in energy levels would be or the awareness of it all. Yeah, even if it's like magnetized, yeah. I mean, when you look at ions, what we were just talking about the, the 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 Neumann. Yeah. Right where it, it it tracks to that. That's why it goes warm. I mean, can you imagine if there was a way? You know, some Einstein type dude said, "Well, all we have to do is just hook up a a couple of electrons." Electrodes and it's gonna and what these electrodes are gonna do is it won't let this energy escape <laughs> and it'll suck it right into the body and boom we're done yeah I mean makes for a great movie but but that makes sense to me because I do believe in reincarnation as but I just not in the mystical form that people have tried to make it I think that there's a mathematical equation that would that would explain it yeah yeah, well, I mean, and that's, uh, I don't know if you've ever studied uh, like Buddhism or anything like that, but Buddhism gets into a lot of the scientific research and it's constantly evolving itself around science. So anytime any kind of significant discovery comes about, Buddhism will reform its whole way of uh, thinking about that. I didn't know that. Yeah, and they really are, they really tie together with any of the scientific research going on. And they've never gone like, well, the books say this, because most of the time, like, they didn't even start writing it down till you know, thousand years later after after uh uh siddhartha gautama was was dead you know like they was always like passed down verbally 
uh, as tradition. And then they, uh, once they started writing it down, everybody broke into this frenzy of like, well, that's not quite what he meant by it all. And it, it broke into all these different sects, just like Christianity or Catholicism has all these different sects. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they've always been super fluctuate or, uh, or um, flexible with the belief structure around Buddhism. And it's always been coherent with the scientific studies going uh-huh. on. Yeah. And um, yeah, ultimately a lot of it, I've been, uh, I've been reading into it a lot, but they, you know, they say it's the, the conscious awareness of uh, the universe and that all your memories are actually this malleable part of your brain and that the awareness doesn't require any of that. And so once it leaves, it doesn't have any of that attachment to this existence or this, you know, uh, the body or anything like that. And so when you, that's how, whenever you end up in a new form, you don't remember anything because memory is a, a function of the brain. And it's a function that we keep to keep track of time and how much time has passed and like sort of uh, log like, Oh, that's dangerous. And that's not dangerous kind of thing. Something that the awareness never really needs to pay attention to. Wow. That is, a, I'm, I'm going to have to read about that. Cause that's right up my alley. That's totally up. Uh, He's going what we talked about though. There's got there's if if that energy is going to end up somewhere, you know, um, physics will. T- I mean, I tell you, there's 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 a there's a there's a reason there's a mathematical equation or something that you can write up that will explain why that happens. Yeah, I think so, man. I mean, it's a physical universe, right? Yeah. So I, there's there's got to be laws of physics that go along with all that. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's interesting. Well, you know, I, I hope they can figure that out before. I want to live forever. I mean, I'm yeah. one of the, <laughs> I would love to live forever. Oh, you know, it's it's forever, sort of, right? Because eventually, uh, the universe will fucking go into its its cold death. Yeah. Uh, and the forever one, you know, there's no way to really get out of the universe per se. We, even if we're able to somehow travel faster than light and catch up to a galaxy that's moving away from us at the speed, you know, like all the galaxies move away from themselves. Yep. And so it's like even getting out of the galaxy is a big deal, but you can't even escape the galaxy into another universe. You'd have to figure out like Rick and Morty level interdimensional travel after you figured out the immortality loophole. Right. And it's like, because re- reincarnation would not work. Uh, here's the, here's the thing. Can reincarnation work? Like, let's say that we set up a colony in, on Mars and, uh, and now we've got, you know, two, two billion people living on Mars, um, somehow or another, they terraform it or they figure out a way to make it work, you know, or, or, uh, humans don't need as much oxygen, whatever. But, um, would reincarnation work? Would, would that energy be able to, to skip the earth and go through space to Mars and enter somebody there? Or is it something that only stays within our atmosphere? That's an interesting concept as well. I've always thought about that. I always thought um, uh, one of the thoughts was like, is it is the awareness tied to the planet where all the life came from right. in the first place, or yeah. is the awareness tied to the universe and the infinite time and space that it represents? Um, and so it's insignificant where that occurs because it always filters back through another dimension of the universe and then back into these three dimensions. And, uh, and I, I mean, ultimately, I never have a conclusion for that because how could you have a conclusion for something like that but uh if it's an yeah. electrical force though if it's an electrical force then it then would have to have it would have to stay here yeah it would have to ha- be a planetary yeah. uh, phenomenon yeah. yeah i mean if you're going to look at the mystical aspects of it and what like you said whether it can 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 travel between space and time and you can end up in the 1920s at some point i mean you know that's not really anything i guess anybody can actually prove they have proven that 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 travel into the future is, is, is possible yeah but if but if travel into the future is possible then if there were a way to come back we would have known about it because somebody would have come back yeah you know uh was it stephen hawking who's the one that did that that sent the letter out and said come to my party oh yeah and it, <laughs> and nobody showed oh stephen hawking right was it oh i thought it was a thing that said uh yeah, the was. time and the place doesn't matter. No, there was an actual place. Yeah, and it was, at, 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 at this particular time, meet me here, and nobody. Uh, nobody I know he showed up. Yeah, for time travel. Yeah, he actually had. Um, I, I think it was Stephen Hawking who said that the only way backwards time travel is possible through a black hole is what through a black hole. Yeah, yeah through two black holes near right. each other. Yeah. They, the the place in between the yeah. two black holes, uh, going encounter. Right. Uh, right. Uh, 
synchronicity or whatever. They're going in opposite directions yep. of each other. And then you can go through the center of that, and that would have enough power to reverse right. space and time backwards. Right. But would it be, I think he also said that it wouldn't, it, the grandfather clause or the grandfather paradox does not apply here because it would be a completely different timeline. Yeah. It wouldn't be the same timeline. You wouldn't be able to go back. I mean, if you could go back into 1920, you wouldn't be able to go back and see your father or your grandfather because it would be a completely different timeline. Yeah, a totally different evolution. With different chain people. Of events yeah. And yeah, it wouldn't even be the same people. It would just be different, just a different timeline. Yeah. And technically, there's supposedly infinite versions of that, yeah. right? Like, yeah, parallel literally every universe. version of that. Like, I know in string theory, they talk about there's like 11 different dimensions. Yeah. That uh, include encompass all versions of all possible timelines, right. and uh, and then there's this newer one that's um, I can't think of the name of it, but it talks about uh, the highest level of dimension being eight levels of dimension, yeah. and uh, and yeah, and that does a, a similar thing where you know there's multiple timelines along the way. Dude, I just thought of something just on a total uh, other a, a totally other uh, subject. God, I wish I could find a chick that could talk like this. <laughs> 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 How cool would that be, man? I don't know why right. I'm <laughs> be able to sit down and like just just chat about. I mean, this thing is, my I I could talk for days on this kind of stuff because it was like again, when meeting Ray Kurzweil back then, I wish I would have known all the stuff that you and I had talked when we met. Yeah, um, I would love to sit down and talk to him about all. He had that pat one patent. Was it the one that where it's for deaf people or for blind people for talking? Yeah, blind people, and it actually reads books to them. That's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's also the original copy copyright right or, or co uh, the the copier copier. Uh, uh, um, to make copies. No, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think he's. I think his patent. I think he he made the very first photocopier. Uh, matter of fact, I got. You want to know? I got. I, I got to look up Ray Kurzweil patents. I was looking it up. I was trying to find how many he has, and I found a list of his patents, but I couldn't find the total number of his patents. But he says some interesting things, man, and like a lot of the stuff, like. Um, People talk about Armageddon and the machines taking over like Terminator style. And it's like, realistically, we are the machines, man. Like with the Neuralink and the advancements in technologies and even like uh, things like um, um, replacement limbs and hearts and, and organs, right? That you can yeah. eventually will just be this advanced species. Almost like uh, the most recent Terminator, the all chick Terminator uh, was a dark fate. Where that uh, the chick comes back to be the savior, and she's just full oh, of oh, advanced parts. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and she's like almost as strong as the robot. It's similar. Similar to that is really more of what we're looking at in the future, where we'll be these advanced people that are all linked to the internet, and we have advanced body parts, and so the machines won't have such a superiority over us. And really, we'll just be merged with this super intelligent, uh, artificial, general intelligent oh, machine. Oh, how many patents does Ray Kurzweil have? Uh, uh, 21 honorary doctorates. Holy shit. Wow. Um, he's so smart. Yeah, he's, he's insane. Like um, his book he wrote in the 80s. Employer Google, huh? Yeah, yeah. Google uh, has him for their artificial intelligence research. Are you serious? Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I I don't know if he was. I think he was the first person that talked about years ago about that someday you'd be able to 3D print um, parts oh. for your body. Yeah. Which they're doing now. Uh, it's interesting. You, you know, 3D but, print organs. Yeah, you 3D print organs. But what they do is they'll take a, um, a heart from or a, a, a liver from a, a pig. And what they do is uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's the equivalent of a shampoo or wh whatever is it that they drip onto the organ. Yeah. And it takes out every, it basically makes it a translucent see-through organ. And then you take the blood from the, from the patient that you're uh, wanting to transplant it in. And then they put that blood into this translucent uh, tissue and it now becomes part of your body at which uh uh there's no uh what do you call it there's rejection no, there's no rejection yeah 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 they do that with uh and they do that with 3d printed uh parts there was a girl that got a 3d printed windpipe and they did the same thing where they um they introduced stem cells from her body and then they absorbed over the top of the 3d printed windpipe and there's yeah there's just zero percentage of uh rejection yeah there were i think it was actually uh, from plants as well i was reading this something they were they were working on on using uh plants instead of uh uh, um, parts from, from, from animals and stuff. Yeah. There was a plant where the, um, cells are really similar to yes. heart cells. Right. Exactly. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 we're watching the same freaking <laughs> channels. <laughs> yeah, we are, aren't we, man? <laughs> yeah. And imagine from uh, we you, you you didn't tell your your your, your viewers where we met. Yeah. Oh, at Area 15, right? Yeah. Where we yeah. were doing, you were playing yeah. your. Uh, you your had the show. whole. Yeah, you had the whole. You had the whole stage set for a whole band, and I went, "What the hell is this?" And he goes, <laughs> I go, no, "It's just me, dude." They, go, they don't tell me anything. Yeah, and we just started. And me, you know, being I don't remember what happened. I, why I just started. I was just started talking, and uh, at some point I caught myself and went, "Oh, he's starting to brown out. And I got to shut up. I'm talking way too much." Oh no! And then we started talking at the end. Started and then that's when the, the whole thing with Ray Kurzweil came up and then yeah. we started talking and then uh and I was like my ears perked up so um and Ray if 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 he actually sees this for whatever reason you know that would be amazing yeah. I'm a big uh, fan yeah if if you remember this would have been I think I think it was 1990 or 1991 and you brought in this keyboard it was Keith Olson and um I hope you got that back wherever I'm at I hope you got that back because uh I was, I was, I, I, I wish that I would have been more excited to be, I, the thing is working, working there, everybody on the planet would come in, you know, Don Henry would walk in and go, Hey, you know, where's Richard Baker, Richard would be in the back and, you know, or I'd be hanging with Alex Leisurewood from Santana and he's like, Hey man, let's, let's, let's work on something, man. I want to, want to sing something, you know, or John Wade, that's a great story. Oh man. Uh, cause Keith also produced the babies. Oh, nice. Yeah. We had the babies at, uh, at Vamped, whatever was left of them. Well, Rick, uh, well, uh, 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 um, uh, Ricky Phillips is where I was six now, so he couldn't have been with him. Yeah. Was John there? It was like, it was like six or seven years ago. Was John singing? I don't remember their names, unfortunately. So, so it's like Foreigner. It's a freaking cover band. Yeah, but they yeah. were called the Babies. There were there were some old cats in there, man. I mean, I'd imagine some of them had to be from uh, the freaking band. No, there's no way because yeah. it, was, it was Ricky Phillips, John Waite. Um, <laughs> there's no way. Jonathan Cain, who's in who's in uh, in uh, in Sticks. Journey, right, and yeah. and I believe um, uh, the guitar player was also in 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 in, in the Babies. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that's another great story. Jonathan Kane was sitting at the piano and he's playing faithfully during the babies before it went to journey. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so Keith went, what are you playing? That's the number one hit. We got to do that. He was, they were working on that record that had midnight rendezvous. Okay. Uh, great record, man. What a great record. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and John uh, shot it down and says, no man, I'm not fucking doing a song about the circus. <laughs> circus, circus life being out on the road it had nothing to do with the circus. Yeah, and so uh, John and so Keith was was really pushing for it, and um, and John was like, "I'm not singing that song, man. Somebody else can fucking sing it." And so Jonathan was like, "Ah, that's all right. I'll save for something else." I got this other this other band I'm working with with uh, this Steve Perry guy, and uh, it ended up being their biggest hit of all time, faithfully. That's awesome. That's yeah. one of my favorite easily one of my favorite journey songs yeah that was a uh, that was great but I, I do have a funny john wade story so i just finished ryan's hope and i'm in um at the china club in cal in california they just opened it uh the owners were friends of mine and guy that was living with me was a front door guy so i'd go there all the time and for whatever reason i for whatever reason i didn't know what he looked like i i heard tom waits um and tom was on all my children with a friend of mine and at one point and uh, so someone said, hey, do you know this guy, uh, uh, you know, Tom Wade's? And I went, no, I don't know him, but he was on the, All My Children with my friend. So I went up to him, and, and, and it really looked funny because he had a really bad, long you know, hair, and he was sitting with some girls. And I went up to him and I said, hey, um, you were uh, on All My Children with my friend Brian. And, and, he, and he says, no, mate, I, I don't know who you are. I go, no, no, trust me, I'm not a, not a fan. I am a fan, but I was on Ryan's Hope when you were doing All My Children. He goes, no, man. I go, you're Tom Waits, right? And he looked at me and went, I'm John Waite, right? Yeah, that's story number one. That's story number one. Uh -huh. And I went, oh, I don't even know who you are, dude, sorry which I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no idea. I mean, I wasn't even a baby's fan. I didn't even know about the band until I started working for That's Keith. Ridiculous. Like, so I'm, uh, so I'm at the studio and, uh, I'm, uh, Keith is in, uh, is in the, uh, is in the, uh, studio with somebody else. Can't remember who it was, but, um, 
John came in. His hair was short. I, I totally recognized him. So he comes in. I'm in, I'm in the front office, and he went. He's walking by. I go, ho, 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 hold on. Can't go in there. And he goes, oh, no, man. He knows I'm coming. I go, yeah, I got to let him know who are you. And he goes, I'm John Waite. I'm going, I'm sorry, who? He goes, John Waite. Mr. Waite, he goes, it's just John Waite. And I'm totally fucking with him, right? <laughs> so I was pushed back to him, and I turn around, and I go, okay, John, wait right here. Ah. <laughs> Burn! That's hilarious. Yeah, it was awesome. But anyway, it just was just trying to say, everybody on the planet would walk in. I, I, I kicked out... Um, Kurt Cobain and Courtney, uh, when they first started, they came in and Keith was like, what those guys get them out of didn't know who they were. They just looked like a bunch of homeless guys. It was good. Cause we, yeah. people go, it was, it was not a good part of town. So you people just randoms would just walk into the studio and we'd be kicking them out all the time. They literally looked like two homeless people and they just, they just wanted to walk in and just kind of see, they thought it was part of the studio. And I had the, uh, the, I had, the, uh, I had the, uh, the great, uh, honor of having to, you know, escort them out of the studio. So. That's funny. Yeah. Oh uh, well, damn, man. I uh, I think we just passed the two hour mark. No on this thing. There's no way that happened so fast, didn't it? What? Yeah. Are you serious? Two hours and two and a half minutes already. Oh my god! Isn't that fantastic? It just it goes. Awesome. It I just no, goes. I had man. no idea it went that fast. Yeah. That's, well, you know when you're having fun talking about interesting stuff. Wow, man. Uh, yeah, you've had a few people. Some some pretty uh, some pretty decent. Uh, yeah. How often do you do these now? I'm I'm putting one out every week, and I'm trying to do you know I try to do like two, possibly three a week, try to keep ahead of the game so I can go out and shoot other videos and you know work's gonna start getting in the way and stuff. You like know what that. I'm gonna do? I'm gonna see if I can't get at some point. This be a really interesting story. I've been trying to get these guys on stage at me at some point. One of my best friends is uh, Eddie Ojeda uh, from the band Twisted Sister. He's oh, okay. They call him Fingers. Uh, he's a league guitar player. Um, that's another great story that I'll save for when, when he's here. But he comes to town once or twice a year. And then Ben Carey, my uh, business partner, who's a league guitar player with uh, Savage Garden and uh, Lifehouse. Oh, cool. And so to have stories, you know, from, you know, a 1980s rock god and, uh, you know, a 90s kind of rock god that everybody knows, and then a washed-up soap, soap actor uh, <laughs> <laughs> could, be, could be an interesting... Um, uh, a, a talk because they, they, both of those guys have some great stories, man. Yeah, I would love to have him on, man. Absolutely. And uh, we just had uh, Keith Robert on. He toured with uh, Twisted Sister a bunch of times. Keith did. Yeah, he was a guitar tech. So they oh, probably I know, know Keith. Him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know Keith. Uh, they the, the very last show they played at uh, at uh, the Hard Rock. Uh, I was at that show. Oh yeah. And um, got to hang with 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 everyone. Uh, Keith wasn't uh, Eddie's guitar tech. He's J, uh, JJ French guitar tech, right? Or do you work on both of them? He, I think he works on both of them, if I do recall. He's like I think one. he's mainly JJ's, and then yeah. he also helps out with the other ones. But he actually got to play with them one time too. Uh, whenever uh, I think JJ couldn't make it or something like that, they needed a they needed a guy to stand in, and he got to. Got to play a show with him. It was just oh, did he cool really? Him. Yeah, that's he's how, got a great picture of it on his wall at home. That's how Tommy got started with, uh, uh, with Kiss? Kiss. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he's another guy you should have on this. That'd be a, that'd be an awesome, an awesome. Oh yeah, Tommy Thayer. Of course. Why wouldn't I? I mean, Tommy's the reason I play uh, uh, Hughes and Kettner uh, amps uh, occasionally yeah. when I can. Uh, uh, I was rehearsing and then bumped into him at Guitar Center. I was just saying hi and and. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah, well, I don't. Yeah. We, 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 I got we, that, that thing. Will, that thing will change to three to three hours if we don't stop now. Yeah, exactly, man. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. I gotta show you my back. Actually, I'm a huge Kiss fan. I have uh, a Kiss piece going on my back right now. The whole side of my back. Oh, really? Kiss piece. Yeah. Oh, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up real quick, and we're gonna uh, chill for a second, man. Right. Uh, but yeah, a hey, um, push that button so the camera's on this guy. Yeah. Thank you for watching to the fullest with Jason Froberg. I really want to thank my guest, Mr. Peter Love, Absolutely. soap opera star, super smart engineer, and, uh, you know, just all around good luck. Talkaholic. Life. Yes, exactly. I knew this was going to go two hours, man. Like, yeah. me and you start talking, and it just freaking goes. Yeah. So make sure you hit subscribe, uh, hit the like button, ring the bell, go to our social media, Give me, pay attention to me. <laughs> 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 this is it to the fullest. Peace. Uh. Thanks for watching To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts here and subscribe by clicking right here. 
We air new podcasts every Monday morning on Space Brain Station and all of your favorite podcast apps.